Chapter Eight, Part Two: A Famous American Statesman by Sarah Knowles Bolton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Charles Sumner, Part Two. Into most lives, especially those designed for great deeds, there seem to come decisive moments when events open the door from the darkness of obscurity into the noonday glare of fame. Such a time came to Sumner in 1845. He was asked to deliver the usual Fourth of July address at Tremont Temple, Boston, as Charles Francis Adams, Horace Mann, and others had done in previous years. He chose for his subject the true grandeur of nations, showing that the true grandeur is peace and not war. He dealt vigorously with the Mexican War, then impending, as a result of the annexation of Texas, with consequent enlargement of slave territory. Sumner was now thirty-four, well-developed physically, his face handsome and radiant as ever, with the smile of his boyhood, his voice clear and resonant, his mind full to overflowing. He spoke for two hours, without notes. He said, The true greatness of a nation cannot be in triumphs of the intellect alone. Literature and art may widen the sphere of its influence. They may adorn it, but they are in their nature but accessories. The true grandeur of humanity is in moral elevation, sustained, enlightened, and decorated by the intellect of man. In our age there can be no peace that is not honorable, there can be no war that is not dishonorable. The true honor of a nation is to be found only in deeds of justice and beneficence, securing the happiness of its people, all of which are inconsistent with war. In the clear eye of Christian judgment, vain are its victories, infamous are its spoils. He is the true benefactor, and alone worthy of honor, who brings comfort where before was wretchedness, who dries the tear of sorrow, who pours oil into the wounds of the unfortunate, who feeds the hungry and clothes the naked, who unlooses the fetter of the slave, who does justice, who enlightens the ignorant, who, by his virtuous genius in art, in literature, in science, enlivens and exalts the hours of life, who, by words or actions, inspires a love for God and for man. This is the Christian hero. This is the man of honor in a Christian land. The believers in war felt somewhat hurt by Sumner's plainness of speech, but the city of Boston and the state of Massachusetts awoke to the knowledge of an eloquent man in their midst, who had doubtless a work before him. Mrs. Lydia Maria Child wrote him, how I did thank you for your noble and eloquent attack upon the absurd barbarism of war. It was worth living for to have done that, if you never do anything more. But the soul that could do that will do more. Chancellor Kent wrote him, I am very strongly in favor of the institution of a Congress of Nations or system of arbitration without going to war. Every effort ought to be made by treaty stipulation, remonstrance, and appeal to put a stop to the resort to brutal force to assert claims of right. The idea of war is horrible. I remember I was very much struck, even in my youth, by the observation, I think it was in Tom Paine's crisis, that he who is the author of war lets loose the whole contagion of hell and opens a vein that bleeds a nation to death. 7,000 copies of this oration were distributed by the Peace Societies of England, and it had a wide reading in our own country. Sumner was now called upon to speak with Garrison, Phillips, and others on the question of the annexation of Texas with her slave territory. He said, God forbid that the votes and voices of the free men of the North should help to bind anew the fetters of the slave. God forbid that the lash of the slave dealer should be nerved by any sanction from New England. God forbid that the blood which spurts from the lacerated quivering flesh of the slave should soil the hem of the white garments of Massachusetts. The educated Boston lawyer, the friend of hosts of authors and jurists on both sides of the ocean, the accomplished and aristocratic scholar, Sumner had placed himself among the despised abolitionists. Many of his friends stood aghast, even refusing to recognize him on the street. This act required great moral heroism, but he was equal to the occasion. The door had opened to fame and immortality, even though they came to him through contumely and well-nigh martyrdom. In 1846, Mr. Sumner spoke before the Phi Beta Kappa Society at Harvard University. We stand on the threshold of a new age, which is preparing to recognize new influences. The ancient divinities of violence and wrong are retreating to their kindred darkness. 
the sun of our moral universe is entering a new ecliptic no longer deformed by those images cancer taurus leo sagittarius but beaming with the mild radiance of those heavenly signs faith hope and charity there's a font about to stream there's a light about to beam there's a warmth about to glow there's a flower about to blow there's a midnight blackness changing into gray men of thought and men of action clear the way theodore parker wrote to the orator you have planted a seed out of which many and tall branches shall arise i hope the people are always true to a good man who truly trusts them you have had opportunity to see hear and feel the truth i think you will have enough more opportunities yet men will look for deeds noble as the words a man speaks and charles sumner became as noble as the words he had spoken it makes us stronger to commit ourselves before the world we are compelled to live up to the standard of our speech or be adjudged hypocrites before the boston mercantile library association sumner read a brilliant paper on white slavery in the barbary states and gave an address before amherst college on fame and glory he spoke earnestly in the whig conventions asking them to come out against slavery he urged daniel webster the defender of the constitution to become the defender of humanity by the side of which that earlier title shall fade into insignificance as the constitution which is the work of mortal hands dwindles by the side of man who is created in the image of god but the words of entreaty came too late the whig party did not dare take up the cause of human freedom in eighteen fifty one when sumner was forty the new era of his life came the free soil party organized august ninth eighteen forty eight the successor of the liberty party formed eight years earlier wanted him as their leader would he separate from the whigs yes for he had said loyalty to principle is higher than loyalty to party the first is a heavenly sentiment from god the other is a device of this earth i wish it to be understood that i belong to the party of freedom to that party which plants itself on the declaration of independence and the constitution of the united states it is said that we shall throw away our votes and that our opposition will fail fail sir no honest earnest effort in a good cause ever fails it may not be crowned with the applause of man it may not seem to touch the goal of immediate worldly success which is the end and aim of so much of life but it is still not lost it helps to strengthen the weak with new virtue to arm the irresolute with proper energy to animate all with devotion to duty which in the end conquers all fail did the martyrs fail when with their precious blood they sowed the seed of the church did the three hundred spartans fail when in the narrow pass they did not fear to brave the innumerable persian hosts whose very arrows darkened the sun no overborne by numbers crushed to earth they have left an example which is greater far than any victory and this is the least we can do our example shall be the source of triumph hereafter millard fillmore had signed the hated fugitive slave bill and webster had made his disastrous speech of march seventh eighteen fifty urging conformity to the demands of the bill sumner's hour had come by a union of the free soil and democratic parties he was elected to the senate of the united states for six years over the eloquent robert c winthrop the whig candidate the contest was bitter sumner would give no pledges and said he would not walk across the room to secure the election on monday december first eighteen fifty one he took his seat devotion to principle had gained him an exalted position months went by before he could possibly obtain a hearing on the slavery question on which issue he had been elected finally the long-sought opportunity came by introducing an amendment that the fugitive slave bill should be repealed he spoke for four hours as only charles sumner could speak despised by the slaveholders they listened to his burning words in closing he said be admonished by those words of oriental piety beware of the groans of wounded souls oppress not to the utmost a single heart for a solitary sigh has power to overset a whole world mr polk of tennessee said to him if you should make that speech in tennessee you would compel me to emaciate my niggers the vote on the repeal stood yeas four nays forty seven alas how many years he wrought before the repeal came sumner had been heard not merely by congress he had been heard by two continents 
Henceforward, for twenty-three years, he was to be in Congress the great leader in the cause of human freedom. In 1854, the advocates of slavery brought forward the Kansas-Nebraska Bill by which a large territory, at the recommendation of Stephen A. Douglas, was to be left open for slavery or no slavery, as the dwellers therein should decide. On the night of the passage of this bill, Sumner made his eloquent protest. Sir, the bill which you are now about to pass is at once the worst and the best bill on which Congress ever acted. Yes, sir, worst and best at the same time. It is the worst bill inasmuch as it is a present victory of slavery. It is the best, for it prepares the way for that all hail hereafter, when slavery must disappear. Thus, sir, now standing at the very grave of freedom in Kansas and Nebraska, I lift myself to the vision of that happy resurrection by which freedom will be secured hereafter, not only in these territories, but everywhere under the national government. More clearly than ever before, I now see the beginning of the end of slavery. Proudly I discern the flag of my country as it ripples in every breeze, at last become in reality, as in name, the flag of freedom. Undoubted, pure, and irresistible. Am I not right, then, in calling this bill the best on which Congress ever acted? Sorrowfully I bend before the wrong you are about to enact. Joyfully I welcome all the promises of the future. After the passage of the bill, the excitement at the North was intense. Public meetings were held, denouncing the new scheme of the slave power to acquire more territory. So bitter grew the feeling that Sumner was urged by his friends to leave Washington, lest harm come to him, but he walked the streets unarmed. He was assailed, said the noble Joshua R. Giddings of Ohio, by the whole slave power in the Senate, and, for a time, he was the constant theme of their vituperation. The maddened waves rolled and dashed against him for two or three days, until, eventually, he obtained the floor himself. Then he arose and threw back the dashing surges with a power of inimitable eloquence utterly indescribable. The Kansas-Nebraska Bill produced its legitimate result, civil war in the territory. Slaveholders rushed in from Missouri, bringing their slaves with them. Free men came from the east to build homes, schoolhouses, and churches on these fertile lands. The struggles at the ballot box over illegal elections were followed by struggles on the battlefield. At the village of Osawatami, 28 free state men, led by John Brown, defeated on the open prairie 56 slave state men. Houses were burned and men murdered. Two state constitutions were adopted, one in Lecompton, representing the pro-slavery element, the other at Lawrence, representing the anti-slavery party. Finally, the president, in 1855, appointed a military governor to restore Kansas to order. But, while order might be restored there, the whole country seemed on the verge of civil war. Meantime, the Republican Party had been formed in 1854, the outgrowth of the Liberty and Free Soil parties. A bill for the admission of Kansas into the Union, having been presented, Sumner made his celebrated speech, The Crime Against Kansas, on the 19th and 20th of May, 1856. He spoke eloquently and fearlessly, arousing more than ever the hot blood of the South. Two days later, as Mr. Sumner was sitting at his desk in the Senate chamber, his head bent forward in writing, the Senate having adjourned, Preston S. Brooks, a nephew of Mr. Butler, a senator of South Carolina, stood before him. I have read your speech twice over, carefully, he said. It is a libel on South Carolina and Mr. Butler, who is a relative of mine. Instantly he struck Mr. Sumner on the back of the head, with his hollow gutta percha cane, making a long and fearful gash, repeating the blows in rapid succession. Sumner wrenched the desk from the floor, to which it was screwed, but, unable to defend himself, fell forward bleeding and insensible. He was carried by his friends to a sofa in the lobby, and during the night lay pale and bewildered, scarcely speaking to anyone about him. The indignation and horror of the North beggar description. That a man in this age of free speech should be publicly beaten, and that by a member of the House of Representatives, was, of course, a disgrace to the nation. Said Joseph Quincy, Charles Sumner needs not our sympathy. If he dies, his name will be immortal. His name will be enrolled with the names of Warren, Sidney, and Russell. If he lives, he is destined to be the light of the nation. Wendell Phillips said, 
The world will yet cover every one of those scars with laurels. He must not die. We need him yet, as the vanguard leader of the hosts of liberty. Nay, he shall yet come forth from that sick chamber, and every gallant heart in the commonwealth be ready to kiss his very footsteps. Brooks was censured by the House of Representatives, resigned his seat, and died the following year. Sumner returned to Boston as soon as he was able. Houses were decorated for his coming, and banners flung to the breeze with the words, Welcome, Freedom's Defender. Massachusetts loves, honors, will sustain, and defend her noble Sumner. The home on Hancock Street was surrounded by a dense crowd. He appeared at the window with his widowed mother and bowed to their cheers. For several months he enjoyed the tender care of this mother, now almost alone. Her son Horace had been lost in the ship Elizabeth, July 16, 1850, when Margaret Fuller, her husband, and child were drowned. Albert, a sea captain, had been lost with his wife and only daughter on their way to France, and now, perhaps, her distinguished son Charles was to give his life to help bring freedom to four millions in slavery. In 1857, Sumner was almost unanimously re-elected to the Senate for six years, but Brooks had done his dreadful work too well. Broken in health, he sailed for Europe. Nearly twenty years before he had gone to meet the honored and famous, his future all unknown. Now he went as the stricken leader of a great cause, one of the most able and eloquent men of the new world. Twenty years before, he was restless and unhappy, because he did not see his life work before him. Now he was happy in spite of physical agony, because he knew he was helping humanity. After traveling in Switzerland, Germany, and Great Britain, he returned and took his seat in Congress, but, finding his health still impaired, he sailed again to Europe. He regretted to leave the country, but was, as he says, often assured and encouraged to feel that to every sincere lover of civilization my vacant chair was a perpetual speech. On this second visit he came under the treatment of Dr. Brown Segward, who, when asked by Mr. Sumner what would cure him, replied, Fire. At once the dreadful remedy was applied. The physician says, when he first met the senator, he could not make use of his brain at all. He could not read a newspaper, could not write a letter. He was in a frightful state as regards the activity of the mind, as every effort there was most painful to him. I told him the truth, that there would be more effect, as I thought, if he did not take chloroform, and so I had to submit him to the martyrdom of the greatest suffering that can be inflicted on mortal man. I burned him with the first moxa. I had the hope that after the first application he would submit to the use of chloroform, but for five times after that he was burned in the same way and refused to take chloroform. I have never seen a patient who submitted to such treatment in that way. Sumner wrote home, it is with a pang unspeakable that I find myself thus arrested in the labors of life and in the duties of my position. This is harder to bear than the fire. Four years elapsed before he regained his health. Indeed, his death finally resulted from the attack of Brooks. No sooner had he returned to the Senate than he made another great speech against slavery. The country was agitated by the coming presidential election. John Brown had captured, with a force of twenty-two men, the United States arsenal at Harper's Ferry, with the fallacious hope of setting the slaves at liberty. He was, of course, overpowered, his sons killed at his side, as others of his sons had been on the Kansas battlefields, and he led out to execution December 2, 1859, with a radiant face and an overflowing heart, because he knew that his death would arouse the nation to action. Mr. Sumner spoke to an immense audience at Cooper Institute, urging the election of Abraham Lincoln. By this election, he said, we shall save the territories from the five-headed barbarism of slavery. We shall save the country and the age from that crying infamy, the slave trade. We shall help save the Declaration of Independence, now dishonored and disowned in its essential life-giving truth. The equality of men, a new order of things will begin, and our history will proceed on a grander scale, in harmony with those sublime principles in which it commenced. Let the kneel sound. Ring out the old, ring in the new, ring out the false, ring in the true. Ring out a slowly dying cause, and ancient forms of party strife. Ring in the nobler modes of life, with sweeter manners, purer laws. A new order of things was indeed begun. South Carolina very soon seceded from the Union, and other southern states followed her example. Sumner now spoke and wrote constantly. 
He urged Massachusetts to be firm, firm, firm against every word or step of concession. More than the loss of forts, arsenals, or the national capital, I fear the loss of our principles. In 1861, Mr. Sumner was made chairman of the Committee on Foreign Relations. How different his position from that day, ten years before, when he stood almost alone in the Senate, a hated abolitionist. When the war began, he saw with prophetic eye the necessity of emancipating the slaves. He urged it in his public speeches. When Lincoln hesitated and the country feared the result, he said to a vast assembly at Cooper Institute, There has been the cry, on to Richmond, and still another worse cry, on to England. Better than either is the cry, on to freedom. As the war went forward, he was ever lost at his post, working for Henry Wilson's bill for the abolishing of slavery in the District of Columbia, for the recognition of the independence of Haiti and Liberia, for the final suppression of the coast-wise trade in slaves, for the employment of colored troops in the army, and for a law that no person shall be excluded from the cars on account of color on various specified lines of railroad. He spoke words of encouragement constantly to the North. There is no time to stop. Forward, forward. Thus do I, who formerly pleaded so often for peace, now sound to arms. But it is because, in this terrible moment, there is no other way to that sincere and solid peace without which there will be endless war. Now at last, by the death of slavery, will the Republic begin to live, for what is life without liberty? Stretching from ocean to ocean, teeming with population, bountiful in resources of all kinds, and thrice happy in universal enfranchisement, it will be more than conqueror, nothing too vast for its power, nothing too minute for its care. He wrote for the magazines on the one great subject. He helped organize the Freedman's Bureau, which he called the bridge from slavery to freedom. He urged equal pay to colored soldiers. He was invaluable to President Lincoln. Though they did not always think alike, Lincoln said to Sumner, There is no person with whom I have more advised throughout my administration than with yourself. When Lincoln was assassinated, Sumner wept by his bedside. The only time, said an intimate friend, I ever saw him weep. When he delivered his eloquent eulogy on Lincoln in Boston, he said, that speech, uttered on the field of Gettysburg, and now sanctified by the martyrdom of its author, is a monumental act. In the modesty of his nature, he said, The world will little note, nor long remember, what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. He was mistaken. The world noted at once what he said, and will never cease to remember it. The battle itself was less important than the speech. Ideas are more than battles. And so, the great slavery pioneer and the great emancipator will go down in history together. How the world worships heroic manhood! Those who, with sweet and unselfish natures, seek not their own happiness, but are ready to die if need be for the right and the truth. Sumner aided in those three grand amendments to the Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. In June 1866, Mr. Sumner came home to say goodbye to his dying mother. True to her noble womanhood, she urged that he should not be sent for, lest the country could not spare him from his work. Beautiful self-sacrifice of woman! Heaven can possess nothing more angelic. O mother, wife, and loved one, know thy unlimited powers, and hold them forever for the ennobling of men. When Mrs. Sumner was buried, her son turned away sorrowfully and exclaimed, I have now no home. He had a house in Washington, where he had lived for many years, 
but it was only home to him where a sweet-faced and sweet-voiced woman loved him. In 1869, Mr. Sumner made his remarkable speech on the Alabama claims, which for a time caused some bitter feeling in England. This vessel, built at Liverpool and manned by a British crew, was sent out by the Confederate government and destroyed 66 of our vessels, with a loss of $10 million. In 1864, she was overtaken in the harbor of Cherbourg, France, by Captain Winslow, commander of the steamer Kearsarge, and sunk, after an hour's desperate fighting. Her commander, Captain Raphael Semis, was picked up by the English Deerhound and taken to Southampton. In the summer of 1872, a board of arbitration met at Geneva, Switzerland, and awarded the United States over $15 million as damages, which Great Britain paid. On May 12, 1870, Mr. Sumner introduced his supplementary civil rights bill, declaring that all persons, without regard to race or color, are entitled to equal privileges afforded by railroads, steamboats, hotels, places of amusement, institutions of learning, religion, and courts of law. His maxim was, equality of rights is the first of rights. He supported Horace Greeley for president, thus separating himself from the Republican Party and carrying out his lifelong opinion that principle is above party. After another visit to Europe in 1872, when he was 61 years old, feeling that, the war being over and slavery abolished, the two portions of the country should forget all animosity and live together in harmony, he introduced a resolution in the Senate, that the names of battles with fellow citizens shall not be continued in the Army Register or placed on the regimental colors of the United States. Massachusetts hastily passed a vote of censure upon her idolized statesman, which she was wise enough to rescind soon after. The latter action gave Mr. Sumner great comfort. He said, The dear old Commonwealth has spoken for me, and that is enough. In his freestone house, full of pictures and books, overlooking Lafayette Square in Washington, on March 11, 1874, Charles Sumner lay dying. The day previous in the Senate, he had complained to a friend of pain in the left side. On the morning of the 11th, he was cold and well-nigh insensible. At 10 o'clock, he said to Judge Hoare, Don't forget my civil rights bill. Later, he said, My book, my book is not finished. I am so tired, I am so tired. He had worked long and hard. He passed into the rest of the hereafter at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Grand, heroic soul, whose life will be an inspiration for all coming time. The body, enclosed in a massive casket, upon which rested a wreath of white azaleas and lilies, was borne to the capital, followed by a company of three hundred colored men and a long line of carriages. The most noticeable among the floral gifts, says Elias Nason, in his Life of Sumner, was a broken column of violets and white azaleas, placed there by the hands of a colored girl. She had been rendered lame by being thrust from the cars of a railroad, whose charter Mr. Sumner, after hearing the girl's story, by a resolution caused to be revoked. From there it was carried to the State House in Boston, and visited by at least 50,000 people. In the midst of the beautiful floral decorations was a large heart of flowers, from the colored citizens of Boston, with the words, Charles Sumner, you gave us your life, we give you our hearts. Through a dense crowd the coffin was borne to Mount Auburn Cemetery and placed in the open grave just as the sun was setting, Longfellow, Holmes, Emerson, and other dear friends standing by. The grand old song of Luther was sung, Ein Festeboik ust unser Gott. Strange contrast, the quiet unknown Harvard law student, the great senator, doctor of laws, author, and orator. Sumner had his share of sorrow. He lived to see seven of his eight brothers and sisters taken away by death. He who had longed for domestic bliss did not find it. He married, when he was fifty-five, Mrs. Alice Mason Hooper, but the companionship did not prove congenial, and a divorce resulted by mutual consent. He forgot the heart-hunger of his early years in living for the slaves and the downtrodden, whether white or black. Through all his struggles he kept a sublime hope. He used to say, All defeats in a good cause are but resting places on the road to victory at last. He had defeats, as do all, but he won the victory. Well says Honorable James G. Blaine in his twenty years of Congress, Mr. Sumner must ever be regarded as a scholar, an orator, a philanthropist, a philosopher, a statesman, 
whose splendid and unsullied fame will always form part of the true glory of the nation. He belongs to all of us, in the North and in the South, said Honorable Carl Schurz, in his eulogy delivered in Music Hall, Boston, to the blacks he helped to make free, and to the whites he strove to make brothers again. On the grave of him whom so many thought to be their enemy, and found to be their friend, let the hands be clasped, which so bitterly warred against each other. Upon that grave let the youth of America be taught, by the story of his life, that not only genius, power, and success, but more than these, patriotic devotion and virtue, make the greatness of the citizen. End of chapter 8「Nine, Part One, of Famous American Statesman by Sarah Knowles Bolton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ulysses S. Grant, Part One. What Longfellow wrote of Charles Sumner may well be applied to Grant. Were a star quenched on high, for ages would its light, still traveling downward from the sky, shine on our mortal sight. So when a great man dies, for years beyond our ken, the light he leaves behind him lies upon the paths of men. The light left by General Grant will not fade out from American history. To be a great soldier is of course to be immortal, but to be magnanimous to enemies, heroic in affections, a master of self, without vanity, honest, courageous, true, invincible, such greatness is far above the glory of battlefields. Such greatness he possessed, who, born in comparative obscurity, came to be numbered in that famous trio dear to every American heart, Washington, Lincoln, Grant. Ulysses Simpson Grant was born April 27, 1822, in a log house at Mount Pleasant, Ohio. The boy seems to have had the blood of soldiers in his veins, for his great-grandfather and great-uncle held commissions in the English army in 1756 in the war against the French and Indians, and both were killed. His grandfather served through the entire war of the Revolution. His father, Jesse R. Grant, left dependent upon himself, learned the trade of a tanner, and by his industry made a home for himself and family. Unable to attend school more than six months in his life, he was a constant reader, and through his own privations became the more anxious that his children should be educated. Ulysses was the first-born child of Jesse Grant and Hannah Simpson, who were married in June 1821. When their son was about a year old, they moved to Georgetown, Ohio, and here the boy passed a happy childhood, learning the very little which the schools of the time were able to impart. He was not fond of study, and enjoyed the more active life of the farm. He says in his personal memoirs, While my father carried on the manufacture of leather and worked at the trade himself, he owned and tilled considerable land. I detested the trade, preferring almost any other labor, but I was fond of agriculture, and of all employment in which horses were used. We had, among other lands, fifty acres of forest within a mile of the village. In the fall of the year, choppers were employed to cut enough wood to last a twelve month. When I was seven or eight years of age, I began hauling all the wood used in the house and shops. I could not load it on the wagons, of course, at that time, but I could drive, and the choppers would load, and someone at the house would unload. When about eleven years old, I was strong enough to hold a plow. From that age until seventeen, I did all the work done with horses, such as breaking up the land, furrowing, plowing corn and potatoes, bringing in the crops when harvested, hauling all the wood, besides tending two or three horses, a cow or two, and sawing wood for stoves, etc., while still attending school. For this, I was compensated by the fact that there never was any scolding or punishing by my parents, no objection to rational enjoyments, such as fishing, going to the creek a mile away to swim in summer, taking a horse and visiting my grandparents in the adjoining county fifteen miles off, skating on the ice in winter, or taking a horse and sleigh when there was snow on the ground. The indulgent father allowed his son some unique experiences. Ulysses, at fifteen, having made a journey to Flat Rock, Kentucky, seventy miles away, with a carriage and two horses, took a fancy to a saddle horse and offered to trade one which he was driving for this animal. The owner hesitated about trading with a lad, but finally consented, and the untried colt was hitched to the carriage with his new mate. 
After proceeding a short distance, the animal became frightened by a dog, kicked, and started to run over an embankment. Ulysses, nothing daunted, took from his pocket a large handkerchief, tied it over the horse's eyes, and sure that the terrified creature would see no more dogs, though he trembled like an aspen leaf, drove peacefully homeward. Young Grant was as truthful as he was calm and courageous. He tells this story of himself. There was a Mr. Ralston living within a few miles of the village who owned a colt which I very much wanted. My father had offered twenty dollars for it, but Ralston wanted twenty-five. I was so anxious to have the colt that after the owner left I begged to be allowed to take him at the price demanded. My father yielded, but said twenty dollars was all the horse was worth, and told me to offer that price. If it was not accepted, I was to offer twenty-two and a half, and if that would not get him, to give the twenty-five. I at once mounted a horse and went for the colt. When I got to Mr. Ralston's house, I said to him, Papa says I may offer you twenty dollars for the colt. I am to offer twenty-two and a half, and if you won't take that, to give you twenty-five. It would not require a Connecticut man to guess the price finally agreed upon. I could not have been over eight years at the time. This transaction caused me great heartburning. The story got out among the boys of the village, and it was a long time before I heard the last of it. Boys enjoy the misery of their companions, at least village boys in that day did, and in later life I have found that all adults are not free from the peculiarity. I kept the horse until he was four years old, when he went blind, and I sold him for twenty dollars. When I went back to Maysville to school in 1836, at the age of fourteen, I recognized my colt as one of the blind horses working on the tread wheel of the ferry boat. All this time the father was desirous of an education for his child. The son of a neighbor had been appointed to West Point and had failed in his examinations. Mr. Grant applied for his son. Ulysses, he said one day, I believe you are going to receive the appointment. What appointment? was the response. To West Point. I have applied for it. But I won't go, said the impetuous boy. But the father's will was law, and the son began to prepare himself. He bought an algebra, but having no teacher, he says it was Greek to him. He had no love for a military life, and looked forward to the West Point experience only as a new opportunity to travel east and see the country. At seventeen he took passage on a steamer for Pittsburgh in the middle of May, 1839. Fortunately, the accommodating boat remained for several days at every port, for passengers or freight, and meantime the curious boy used his eyes to learn all that was possible. When he reached Harrisburg, he rode to Philadelphia on the first railroad which he had ever seen, except the one on which he had just crossed the summit of the Allegheny Mountains. In traveling by the road from Harrisburg, he says, I thought the perfection of rapid transit had been reached. We traveled at least eighteen miles an hour, when at full speed, and made the whole distance averaging probably as much as twelve miles an hour. This seemed an annihilating pace. I stopped five days in Philadelphia, saw about every street in the city, attended the theater, visited Girard College, which was then in course of construction, and got reprimanded from home afterwards, for dallying by the way so long. I reported at West Point on the 30th or 31st of May, and about two weeks later passed my examinations for admission, without difficulty, very much to my surprise. A military life had no charms for me, and I had not the faintest idea of staying in the army, even if I should be graduated, which I did not expect. The encampment which preceded the commencement of academic studies was very wearisome and uninteresting. When the 28th of August came, the date for breaking up camp and going into barracks, I felt as though I had been at West Point always, and that if I stayed to graduation, I would have to remain always. I did not take hold of my studies with avidity. In fact, I rarely ever read over a lesson the second time during my entire cadetship. I could not sit in my room doing nothing. There is a fine library connected with the academy, from which cadets can get books to read in their quarters. I devoted more time to these than to books relating to the course of studies. Much of the time, I am sorry to say, was devoted to novels, but not those of a trashy sort. I read all of Bulwer's then published, Cooper's, Marriott's, Scott's, Washington Irving's works, Lavar's, and many others that I do not now remember. Mathematics was very easy to me, so that when January came I passed the examination, taking a good standing in that branch. In French, the only other study at the time in the first year's course, my standing was very low. 
In fact, if the class had been turned the other end foremost, I should have been near the head. The years at West Point did not go by quickly, only the ten weeks of vacation which seemed shorter than one week in school. Sometimes at the academy a great general, like Winfield Scott, came to review the cadets. With his commanding figure, says young Grant, his quite colossal size, and showy uniform, I thought him the finest specimen of manhood my eyes had ever beheld, and the most to be envied. I could never resemble him in appearance, but I believe I did have a presentiment, for a moment, that some day I should occupy his place on review, although I had no intention then of remaining in the army. My experience in a horse trade ten years before, and the ridicule it caused me, were too fresh in my mind for me to communicate this presentiment to even my most intimate chum. How often into lives there comes a feeling that there is a specified work to be done by us that no other person can or will ever do. When the years were over at West Point, each four times as long as Ohio years, young Grant was anxious to enter the cavalry, especially as he had suffered from a cough for six months, and his family feared consumption. Having gone home, he waited anxiously for his new uniform. I was impatient, he says, to get on my uniform and see how it looked, and probably wanted my old schoolmates, particularly the girls, to see me in it. The conceit was knocked out of me by two little circumstances that happened soon after the arrival of the clothes, which gave me a distaste for military uniform that I never recovered from. Soon after the arrival of the suit, I donned it and put off for Cincinnati on horseback. While I was riding along a street of that city, imagining that everyone was looking at me with a feeling akin to mine when I first saw General Scott, a little urchin, bareheaded, barefooted, with dirty and ragged pants held up by a single gallows, that's what suspenders were called then, and a shirt that had not seen a washtub for weeks, turned to me and cried, Soldier, will you work? No siree, I'll sell my shirt first. The horse trade and its dire consequences were recalled to mind. The other circumstance occurred at home. Opposite our house in Bethel stood the old stage tavern where man and beast found accommodation. The stableman was rather dissipated, but possessed of some humor. On my return, I found him parading the streets and attending in the stable, barefooted, but in a pair of sky-blue nankeen pantaloons, just the color of my uniform trousers, with a stripe of white cotton sheeting sewed down the outside seams in imitation of mine. The joke was a huge one in the minds of many of the people, and was much enjoyed by them, but I did not appreciate it so highly. In September 1843, Grant reported for duty at Jefferson Barracks, St. Louis, the largest military post in the United States at that time. His hope was to become assistant professor of mathematics at West Point, and he would have been appointed had not the Mexican War begun soon after. A new page was now to be turned in the eventful life of the young officer, when he was to have, as Emerson beautifully says of love, the visitation of that power to his heart and brain which created all things anew, which was the dawn in him of music, poetry, and art, which made the face of nature radiant with purple light, the morning and the night varied enchantments, when a single tone of one voice could make the heart bound, and the most trivial circumstance associated with one form is put in the amber of memory when he became all eye when one was present, and all memory when one was gone, when the moonlight was a pleasing fever, and the stars were letters, and the flowers ciphers, and the air was coined into song, when all business seemed an impertinence, and all the men and women running to and fro in the streets were pictures. At West Point, Grant's classmate was F. T. Dent, whose family resided five miles west of Jefferson Barracks. Two of his unmarried brothers, says Grant, were living at home at that time, and, as I had taken with me from Ohio my horse, saddle, and bridle, I soon found my way out to Whitehaven, the name of the Dent estate. As I found the family congenial, my visits became frequent. There were at home, besides the young men, two daughters, one a schoolmiss of fifteen, the other a girl of eight or nine. There was still an older daughter of seventeen, who had been spending several years at boarding school in St. Louis, but who, though through school, had not yet returned home. In February she returned to her country home. After that I do not know but my visits became more frequent, they certainly did become more enjoyable. We would often take walks, or go on horseback together to visit the neighbors, until I became quite well acquainted in that vicinity. If the 4th Infantry had remained at Jefferson Barracks, it is possible, even probable, 
that this life might have continued for some years without my finding out that there was anything serious the matter with me. But in the following May, a circumstance occurred which developed my sentiment so palpably that there was no mistaking it. This circumstance was the annexation of Texas, the probability of a war with Mexico, and the necessity of leaving Jefferson Barracks for the Texan frontier. Alas, now that days full of hope and the sweet realization of a divine companionship had come, they must have sudden ending. Grant took a brief furlough, went to say goodbye to his father and mother, and then went to White Haven to see Julia Dent. In crossing a swollen stream, his uniform was wet through, but he donned the suit of a future brother-in-law, and appeared before his beloved to ask her hand in marriage, to receive her acceptance, and then to hasten to the scene of action. He saw her but once in the next four years and three months, four anxious years to her, when death often stared her lover in the face. As soon as Texas was admitted to the Union, in 1845, the Army of Occupation, as the 3,000 men under General Zachary Taylor were called, advanced to the Rio Grande and built a fort. When the first hostile gun was fired, Grant says, I felt sorry that I had enlisted. A great many men, when they smell battle afar off, chafed to get into the fray. When they say so themselves, they generally fail to convince their hearers that they are as anxious as they would like to make believe, and as they approach danger, they become more subdued. This rule is not universal, for I have known a few men, who were always aching for a fight when there was no enemy near, who were as good as their word when the battle did come on. But the number of such men is small. The first battle was at Palo Alto, meaning tall trees or woods, six miles from the Rio Grande. In the early forenoon of May 8th, Taylor's 3,000 men were drawn up in line of battle, opposed by superior numbers. The infantry was armed with flintlock muskets and paper cartridges charged with powder, buckshot, and ball. At the distance of a few hundred yards, says Grant, a man might fire at you all day without your finding it out. The artillery consisted of two batteries and two 18-pounder iron guns, with three or four 12-pounder howitzers throwing shell. The firing was brisk on both sides. One cannonball passed near Grant, killing several of his companions. After a hard day's fight, the enemy retreated in the night. The war had now begun in earnest, and the man who at the first hostile gun felt sorry that he had enlisted, was ready to brave danger on any field. In the hard-fought battle of Monterey, between 6,500 men under Taylor and 10,000 Mexicans, Grant's curiosity got the better of his judgment, and, leaving the camp, where he had been ordered to remain, he mounted a horse and rode to the front. He made the charge with the men, when about a third of their number were killed. He loaned his horse to the adjutant of the regiment, Lieutenant Hoskins, who was soon killed and Grant was designated to act in his place. The ammunition became low, and to return for it was so dangerous that the general commanding did not like to order anyone to fetch it, so called for a volunteer. Grant modestly says, I volunteered to go back to the point we had started from. My ride back was an exposed one. Before starting, I adjusted myself on the side of my horse furthest from the enemy, and with only one foot holding to the cantle of the saddle, and an arm over the neck of the horse exposed, I started at full run. It was only at street crossings that my horse was under fire, but these I crossed at such a flying rate that generally I was passed and under cover of the next block of houses before the enemy fired. I got out safely without a scratch. When Monterey was conquered and the garrison marched out as prisoners, young Grant was moved to pity, as he says in his memoirs, thus showing a gentle nature, which he bore years later when thousands were falling around him, and he was still obliged to say, forward. After the capture of Veracruz, and the surprise at Cerro Gordo, where 3,000 Mexicans were made prisoners, the army advanced toward the city of Mexico. Between three and four miles from the city stood Molino del Rey, the mill of the king, an old stone structure, one story high, flat roof, and several hundred feet long. Sandbags were laid along the roof, and good marksmen fought behind them. Nearby was Chapultepec, 300 feet high, fortified on the top and on its rocky sides. From the front, guns swept the approach to Molino. Yet, on the morning of September 8th, the assault upon Molino was made, young Grant being among the foremost. The loss was severe, especially among commissioned officers. Grant says, I was with the earliest of the troops to enter the mills, and passing through to the north side, looking toward Chapultepec, 
I happened to notice that there were armed Mexicans still on top of the building, only a few feet from many of our men. Not seeing any stairway or ladder reaching to the top of the building, I took a few soldiers and had a cart that happened to be standing near brought up, and, placing the shifts against the wall, and chocking the wheels so that the cart could not back, used the shafts as a sort of ladder, extending to within three or four feet of the top. By this I climbed to the roof of the building, followed by a few men, but found a private soldier had preceded me by some other way. There were still quite a number of Mexicans on the roof, among them a major and five or six officers of lower grades, who had not succeeded in getting away before our troops occupied the building. They still held their arms, while the soldier before mentioned was walking as sentry, guarding the prisoners he had surrounded all by himself. I halted the sentinel, received the swords from the commissioned officers, and proceeded, with the assistance of the soldiers now with me, to disable the muskets by striking them against the edge of the wall and throwing them to the ground below. Five days after the fall of Molino, Chapultepec was taken with severe loss. Grant was mentioned in the official report as having behaved with distinguished gallantry. Just before the city of Mexico fell into our hands, Grant was made first lieutenant. Promotion had not come rapidly. It is sometimes better if success does not come to us early in life, to learn how to work steadily day after day, with an unalterable purpose, to learn how to concentrate thought and willpower, how to conquer self through failure and hope deferred, is often essential for him who is to govern either by physical or moral power. After Mexico fell, and General Scott lived in the halls of the Montezumas, he controlled the city as a Havelock or a Gordon might have done and Grant learned, by observation, the best of all lessons for a soldier, to be magnanimous to a fallen foe. He learned other valuable lessons in this war, made the acquaintance of the officers with whom he was to measure his strength in the most stupendous war of modern times twenty years later. When the Treaty of Peace was signed between our country and Mexico, February 2, 1848, whereby we paid $15 million for the territory ceded to us, Grant obtained leave of absence for four months. One person must have been inexpressibly thankful that his life had been spared. Four years, and she had seen him but once. How noble we often become by the mellowing power of circumstances which prevent our having our own way. Discipline may be only another word for achievement. U.S. Grant and Julia Dent were married August 22, 1848, when he was twenty-six, and began a life of affection and helpfulness, which grew brighter till the end came on Mount McGregor. There was reason why the affection lasted through all the years. In the best sense, they lived for each other. Those who find their happiness outside the home are apt to find little inside the home. Devotion begets devotion, and men and women must expect to receive only what they give. Affection scattered produces a scanty harvest. The winter of 1848 was spent at the post of Sackett's Harbor, New York, the next two years at Detroit, Michigan. In 1852, Grant was ordered to the Pacific Coast, and now the young husband and wife must be separated, she to go to her home in St. Louis, and he to the then unsettled West. When Aspinwall was reached, the streets of the town were a foot under water, in a blazing tropical sun. Cholera broke out among the troops, as it had among the inhabitants, and a third of the people died. The crossing of the Isthmus of Panama on the backs of mules was tedious and trying. San Francisco was reached early in September. The gold mining fever was at its height. Soon the troops passed up to Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River, and a quiet and dull life began. Measles and smallpox were killing the Indians so rapidly that the gun of the white man was superfluous as an agent of destruction. In 1854, six years after Grant's marriage, despairing of supporting his wife and two children on the Pacific coast with his pay as an army officer, he resigned. His prospects now were not bright. Without a profession, save that of arms, he was to begin, at thirty-two, a struggle for support, which must have tested the affection of the woman who married the young officer in her hopeful girlhood. She owned a farm in St. Louis, and thither they moved as their home. He says of the farm, I had no means to stock it, a house had to be built also. I worked very hard, never losing a day because of bad weather, and accomplished the object in a moderate way. If nothing else could be done, I would load a cord of wood on a wagon and take it to the city for sale. I managed to keep along very well until 1858, when I was attacked by fever and ague. 
I had suffered very severely, and for a long time, from this illness while a boy in Ohio. It lasted now over a year, and, while it did not keep me in the house, it did interfere greatly with the amount of work I was able to perform. In the fall of 1858, I sold out my stock, crops, and farming utensils at auction, and gave up farming. Four years of struggling had not paid pecuniarily. Poverty is not a pleasant school in which to be nurtured. Blessings upon those who do not grow harsh or discontented with its bitter lessons. To keep sunshine in the face when want knocks at the heart is to win the victory in a dreadful battle. And yet many are able to accomplish this, and brighten with their happy faces lives more prosperous than their own. In the winter of 1858, Captain Grant established a partnership with a cousin of his wife in the real estate business. Again separation came. The little family were left on the farm, while the father tried another method of earning a living for them. Our business, he says, might have become prosperous if I had been able to wait for it to grow. As it was, there was no more than one person could attend to, and not enough to support two families. While a citizen of St. Louis, and engaged in the real estate agency business, I was a candidate for the office of county engineer, an office of respectability and emolument which would have been very acceptable to me at that time. The incumbent was appointed by the county court, which consisted of five members. My opponent had the advantage of birth over me, he was a citizen by adoption, and carried off the prize. I now withdrew from the co-partnership with Boggs, and, in May 1860, removed to Galena, Illinois, and took a clerkship in my father's store. He was once more in the tannery business, which he had so hated when a boy. It was well that men and women are spurred to duty because somebody depends upon them for daily food, otherwise this life of often uncongenial labor would be unbearable. We rarely do what we like to do in this world. We do what the merciless goad of circumstance forces us to do. He is wise who goes to his work with a smile. The year 1860 opened upon a new era in this country. Slavery and anti-slavery had struggled together till the election of Abraham Lincoln to the presidency told that the decisive hour had come. The nation could no longer exist, half slave and half free. When Mr. Lincoln was inaugurated March 4, 1861, the southern states seceded, one after another, until eleven had separated from the Union. Most of the southern forts were already in the hands of the Confederates. Fort Sumter, in the harbor of Charleston, still remained under the control of the Union. While besieged by the South, an effort was made to send supplies to our starving garrison. The fort was fired upon April 11, 1861, and that shot, like the one at Concord, was heard round the world. From that hour, slavery was doomed. The President issued his first call for 75,000 volunteers for 90 days. The North and West seemed to respond as one man. The intense excitement reached the little town of Galena. The citizens were at once called together. Business was suspended. In the evening, the courthouse was packed. Captain Grant was asked to conduct the meeting. The people naturally turned to one who understood battles when they saw war close at hand. With much embarrassment, Grant presided. The leather business was finished for him from that eventful night. The women of Galena were as deeply interested as the men. They came to Grant to obtain a description of the United States uniform for infantry, subscribed and bought the material, procured tailors to cut the garments, and made them with their own willing hands. More and more, with their superior education, women are to play an important part in this country, both in peace and war. Captain Grant was now asked by Governor Yates of Illinois to go into the Adjutant General's office and render such assistance as he could, which position he accepted, but he modestly says, I was no clerk, nor had I any capacity to become one. The only place I ever found in my life to put a paper so as to find it again was either a side coat pocket or in the hands of a clerk or secretary more careful than myself. But I had been quartermaster, commissary, and adjutant in the field. The army forms were familiar to me, and I could direct how they should be made out. Though a man of few words, those few could be effective if Grant chose to use them. Meeting in St. Louis in a streetcar, a young braggart, who said to him, Where I come from, if a man dares to say a word in favor of the Union, we hang him to a limb of the first tree we come to. Grant replied, We are not so intolerant in St. Louis as we might be. I have not seen a single rebel hung yet, nor heard of one. There are plenty of them who ought to be, however. 
the young man did not continue the conversation. In May, 1861, Grant wrote a letter to the Adjutant General of the Army of Washington, saying that, as he had been in the regular army for fifteen years, and educated at government expense, he tendered his services for the war. No notice was ever taken of the letter, and of course no answer was returned. Soon after he spent a week with his parents in Covington, Kentucky. Twice he called upon Major General McClellan, at Cincinnati, just across the river, whom he had known slightly in the Mexican War, with the hope that he would be offered a position on his staff. But he failed to see the general and returned to Illinois. He was not to serve under McClellan. A different destiny awaited him. President Lincoln now called for 300,000 men to enlist for three years or the war. Governor Yates appointed Grant colonel of the 21st Illinois Regiment. Another separation from wife and children had come. The beginning of a great career had come also. The regiment repaired to Springfield, Illinois, and after some time spent in drill, was ordered to move against Colonel Thomas Harris, encamped at the little town of Florida. There was no bravado in the man who had fought so bravely in all the battles of the Mexican War. He says, as we approached the brow of the hill from which it was expected we could see Harris's camp, and possibly find his men ready formed to meet us, my heart kept getting higher and higher, until it felt to me as though it was in my throat. I would have given anything then to have been back in Illinois, but I had not the moral courage to halt and consider what to do. I kept right on. When we reached a point from which the valley below was in full view, I halted. The place where Harris had been encamped a few days before was still there, and the marks of a recent encampment were plainly visible, but the troops were gone. My heart resumed its place. It occurred to me at once that Harris had been as much afraid of me as I had been of him. This was a view of the question I had never taken before, but it was one I never forgot afterwards. From that event to the close of the war, I never experienced trepidation upon confronting an enemy, though I always felt more or less anxiety. I never forgot that he had as much reason to fear my forces as I had his. The lesson was valuable. Soon after this, Lincoln asked the Illinois delegation in Congress to recommend some citizens of the state for the position of Brigadier General, and Grant, to his great surprise, was recommended first on a list of seven. After his appointment, he spent several weeks in Missouri, whither he had been ordered. His first battle was at Belmont, where, in a severe engagement of four hours, the loss of our side was 485 and the Confederate loss 642. Grant's horse was shot under him. After the battle, the Confederates received reinforcements, and there was danger that our men could not return to the transports on which they had come to Belmont. We are surrounded, they cried. Well, said their cool leader, if that be so, we must cut our way out as we cut our way in. And so they did. Grant, meantime, rode out into a cornfield alone to observe the enemy. While there, as he afterwards learned, the southern General Polk and one of his staff saw the Union soldier and said to their men, There is a Yankee. You may try your marksmanship on him if you wish. But strangely enough, nobody fired, and Grant's valuable life was spared. He soon perceived that he was the only man between the Confederates and the boats. His horse seemed to realize the situation. Grant says, There was no path down the bank, and everyone acquainted with the Mississippi River knows its banks, in a natural state, do not vary at any great angle from the perpendicular. My horse put his fore foot over the bank without hesitation or urging, and, with his hind feet well under him, slid down the bank and trotted aboard the boat, twelve or fifteen feet away, over a single gangplank. I dismounted and went at once to the upper deck. When I first went on deck, I entered the captain's room, adjoining the pilot house, and threw myself on a sofa. I did not keep that position a moment, but rose to go out on the deck to observe what was going on. I had scarcely left when a musket ball entered the room, struck the head of the sofa, passed through it, and lodged in the boat. Thus again was his life saved. Until February of the following year, 1862, Little was done by the troops, except to become ready for the great work before them. The enemy occupied strong points on the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers, at Forts Henry and Donelson, points as essential to us as to them. These Grant determined to take, if possible. Truly, said President Lincoln, wherever Grant is, things move. I have noticed that from the beginning. On February 2nd, the expedition started against Fort Henry, with about 17,000 men. Several gunboats under Commodore Foote accompanied the army. At a given hour the troops and gunboats moved together, 
the one to invest the garrison, the other to attack the fort. After a severe fight of an hour and a half, every gun was silenced. General Lloyd Tilgeman surrendered, with his seventeen heavy guns, ammunition, and stores. Fort Donelson must now be taken, strongly fortified as it was. It stood on high ground, with rifle pits running back two miles from the river, and was defended by fifteen heavy guns, two carronades, and seventy-five pieces of artillery. Outside the rifle pits, trees had been felled, so that the tops lay toward the attacking army. Our men had to shelter from the snow and rain in this midwinter siege. No campfires could be allowed where the enemy could see them. In the march from Fort Henry to Fort Donelson, numbers of the tired troops had thrown away their blankets and overcoats, and there was much real suffering. But war means discomfort and woe as well as death itself. At three o'clock, February 14th, Commodore Foote's gunboats attacked the water batteries, and after a severe encounter, several of them were disabled. The one upon which the Commodore stood was hit about sixty times, one shot killing the pilot, carrying away the wheel, and wounding the commander. The night came on intensely cold. The next morning the enemy, taking heart, came against the national forces to cut their way out. Then Grant rode among his men, saying, Whichever party first attacks now will whip, and the rebels will have to be very quick if they beat me. Fill your cartridge boxes quick, and get into line. The enemy is trying to escape, and he must not be permitted to do so. Our men worked their way through the abatis of trees, took the outer line of rifle pits, and bivouacked within the enemy's lines. A driving storm of snow and hail set in, and many soldiers were frozen on that dismal night. There must have been little sleep, amid the firing of the Confederate pickets and the groans of the wounded on that frozen ground. During the night the Confederate generals, Floyd and Pillow, left the fort with three thousand men and Forrest with another thousand. On the morning of February 16th, Brigadier General S. B. Buckner sent a note to General Grant suggesting an armistice. The following reply was returned at once. Sir, yours of this date, proposing armistice and appointment of commissioners to settle terms of capitulation, is just received. No terms except an unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. From that day, U.S. Grant became to the people of the North unconditional surrender grant. Precious words indeed, to the army as well as the people, to whom decisive action meant peace at last. General Buckner considered the terms ungenerous and unchivalrous, but he surrendered his sixty-five guns, seventeen thousand six hundred small arms, and nearly fifteen thousand troops. Our loss in killed, wounded, and missing was about two thousand. The Confederate loss was believed to be about twenty-five hundred. This victory, the first great victory of the war, caused much rejoicing at the North, and Grant was at once made Major General of Volunteers. Two weeks from this time, he was virtually under arrest for not conforming to orders which he never received, but he was soon restored to his position. The country was to learn later, what Lincoln learned early in the war, that one head for an army is better than several heads. The next great battle under Grant was at Shiloh, near Pittsburgh Landing. On the morning of April 6, 1862, the Confederates, under General Attorney Sidney Johnston and Beauregard, rushed upon the national lines. All day Sunday the battle raged, and at night the Union forces had fallen back a mile in the rear of their position in the morning. Sherman, who commanded the ridge on which stood the long meeting house of Shiloh, was twice shot, once in the hand and once in the shoulder, a third ball passing through his hat. Grant could well say of this brave officer, I never deemed it important to stay long with Sherman. During the night after the desperate battle, the rain fell in torrents upon the two armies, who slept upon their arms. General Grant's headquarters were under a tree, a few hundred yards back from the river. Some time after midnight, he says, growing restive under the storm and the continuous rain, I moved back to the log house under the bank. This had been taken as a hospital, and all night wounded men were brought in, their wounds dressed, a leg or an arm amputated, as the case might require, and everything being done to save life or alleviate suffering. The sight was more unendurable than encountering the enemy's fire, and I returned to my tree in the rain. In battle, the great general could look on men falling about him apparently unmoved. When the battle was over, he could not bear the sight of pain. The men revered him, because, while he led them into death, he almost surely led them into victory. End of chapter 9, part 1.
Chapter Nine, Part Two of Famous American Statesmen by Sarah Knowles Bolton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ulysses S. Grant, Part Two. On April seventh, the battle raged all along the line, and the enemy were everywhere driven back. At three o'clock, Grant gathered up a couple of regiments, formed them into line of battle, and marched them forward, going in front himself to prevent long-range firing. The command charge was given, and it was executed with loud cheers and a run, as the enemy broke. Grant came near losing his life. A ball struck the metal scabbard of his sword just below the hilt, and broke it nearly off. Night closed upon a victorious Union army, but the victory had been gained at a fearful cost. Shiloh, says General Grant, was the severest battle fought at the West during the war, and but few in the East equaled it for hard, determined fighting. I saw an open field in our possession on the second day, over which the Confederates had made repeated charges the day before, so covered with dead that it would have been possible to walk across the clearing in any direction stepping on dead bodies without a foot touching the ground. On our side, National and Confederate troops were mingled together in about equal proportions, but on the remainder of the field nearly all were Confederates. On one part, which had evidently not been plowed for several years, probably because the land was poor, bushes had grown up, some to the height of eight or ten feet. There was not one of these left standing unpierced by bullets. The smaller ones were all cut down. During the first day, the brave Albert Sidney Johnston was wounded. He would not leave the battlefield, but continued in the saddle, giving commands, till exhausted by loss of blood, he was taken from his horse and died soon after. The Union loss was reported to be over 13,000. Some estimate the losses at not less than 15,000 on each side. Up to this time, Grant had hoped that a few such victories as Fort Donelson would dishearten the South. Now he saw that conquest alone could compel peace with a brave and heroic people of our own blood and race. From this time, the work of laying waste the enemy's country began, with the hope that the sooner supplies were exhausted, the sooner peace would be possible. On October 25th, the Battle of Corinth having been fought October 3rd, General Grant was placed in command of the Department of the Tennessee and began the Vicksburg Campaign. The capture of this place would afford free navigation of the Mississippi. For three months, plan after plan was tried for the reduction of this almost impregnable position. Sherman made a direct attack at the only point where a landing was practicable, and failed. Grant's army was stationed on the wheat bank of the river, on marshy ground, full of malaria from recent rains. The troops were ill of fever, measles, and smallpox, and many died. There could be found scarcely enough dry land on which to pitch their tents. It was finally decided to cut a canal across the peninsula in front of Vicksburg, that the gunboats might safely pass through to a point below the city. Four thousand men began work on the canal, but a sudden rise in the river broke the dam and stopped the work. A second method was tried, by breaking levees and widening and connecting streams between Lake Providence, seventy miles above Vicksburg, through the Red River, into the Mississippi again four hundred miles below, but this project was soon abandoned. Meantime, the North had become restless, and many clamored for Grant's removal, declaring him incompetent, but, amid all the reproaches, he kept silent. When Lincoln was urged to make a change, he said simply, I rather like the man, I think we'll try him a little longer. At length, it was decided to attempt to run the gunboats past the batteries, march the troops down the west bank of the river, cross over to the east side, and attack the rear of Vicksburg. The steamers were protected as far as possible with bales of hay, cotton, and grain, for the boilers could not bear the enemy's fire. On the 16th of April, 1863, on a dark night, the fleet was ready for the dangerous passage. As soon as the boats were discovered, the batteries opened fire, piles of combustibles being lighted along the shore that proper aim might be taken against the fleet. Every transport was struck. As fast as the shots made holes, the men put cotton bags in the openings. For nearly three hours the eight gunboats and three steamers were under a merciless fire. The Henry Clay was disabled and soon set on fire by the bursting of a shell in the cotton packed about her boilers. Grant watched the passage of the fleet from a steamer in the river and felt relieved as though the victory were close at hand. Soon after, the whole force of 33,000 men were crossed below Vicksburg. Fifty miles to the east, the Confederate general, Joseph E. Johnston, had a large army, which must be crippled before Vicksburg could be besieged. Port Gibson, near the river, was first taken by our troops. 
then Raymond, May 12th, Jackson, May 18th, Champion Hill, May 16th, and then Black River Bridge. Grant had beaten Johnston in the rear. Now he must beat Pemberton with his nearly 50,000 men shut up in Vicksburg. On May 19th, the city of Vicksburg was completely invested by our troops. Says General Grant, five distinct battles had been fought and won by the Union forces. The capital of the state had fallen, and its arsenals, military manufactories, and everything useful for military purposes had been destroyed. An average of about 180 miles had been marched by the troops engaged, but five days' rations had been issued, and no forage. Over 6,000 prisoners had been captured, and as many more of the enemy had been killed or wounded. Twenty-seven heavy cannon and sixty-one field pieces had fallen into our hands, and four hundred miles of the river, from Vicksburg to Port Hudson, had become ours. And now the siege began. By June thirtieth, there were two hundred and twenty guns in position, besides a battery of heavy guns, manned and commanded by the Navy. The besiegers had no mortars, save those of the Navy in front of the city, but they took tough logs, bored them out for six or twelve pound shells, bound them with strong iron bands, and used them effectively in the trenches of the enemy. The eyes of the whole country were centered on Vicksburg. Mines were dug by both armies and exploded. Among the few men who reached the ground alive, after having been thrown up by the explosions, was a colored man, badly frightened. Someone asked how high he had gone up. Dunno, massa, but tink bout three mile, was the reply. Meantime, the people in Vicksburg were living in caves and cellars to escape the shot and shell. Starvation began to stare them in the face. Flour was sold at five dollars a pound, molasses at ten and twenty dollars a gallon. Yet the brave people held out against surrender. A Confederate woman, says General Badeau, in his graphic Military History of U.S. Grant, asked Grant, tauntingly, as he stopped at her house for water, if he ever expected to get into Vicksburg. Certainly, he replied. But when? I cannot tell exactly when I shall take the town, but I mean to stay here till I do, if it takes me thirty years. All through the siege the men of both armies talked to each other, the Confederates and Unionists calling each other respectively, Yanks and Johnnies. Well, Yank, when are you coming into town? We propose to celebrate the Fourth of July there, Johnny. The Vicksburg paper said, prior to the Fourth, in speaking of the Yankee boast that they would take dinner in Vicksburg that day, the best receipt for cooking a rabbit is, first, catch your rabbit. The last number of the paper was issued on July 4th and said, The Yankees have caught the rabbit. On July 3rd, at 10 o'clock, white flags began to appear on the enemy's works, and two men were seen coming towards the Union lines bearing a white flag. They bore a message from General Pemberton, asking for an armistice to be granted, and three commissioners appointed to confer with a like number named by Grant. I make this proposition to save the further effusion of blood, said General Pemberton, which must otherwise be shed to a frightful extent, feeling myself fully able to maintain my position for a yet indefinite period. To this Grant replied, The useless effusion of blood you propose stopping by this course can be ended at any time you choose, by the unconditional surrender of the city and garrison. Men who have shown so much endurance and courage as though now in Vicksburg will always challenge the respect of an adversary, and I can assure you, will be treated with all the respect due to prisoners of war. On the afternoon of July 3rd, Grant and Pemberton met under a stunted oak tree, a few hundred yards from the Confederate lines. They had known each other in the Mexican War. A kindly conference was held, and honorable terms of surrender agreed upon, the officers taking their sidearms and clothing, and staff and cavalry officers one horse each. When the men passed out of the works they had so gallantly defended, not a cheer went up from our men, nor was a remark made that could cause pain. The garrison surrendered at Vicksburg, numbered over 31,000 men and 60,000 muskets, and over 170 cannon. Five days later, Port Hudson, lower on the river, surrendered, with 6,000 prisoners and 51 guns. There was great rejoicing at the North. Lincoln wrote to Grant, my dear general i do not remember that you and i have ever met personally i write this now as a grateful acknowledgment for the almost inestimable service you have done the country i write to say a word further when you first reached the vicinity of vicksburg i thought you should do what you finally did march the troops across the neck run the batteries with the transports and then go below and i never had any faith except a general hope that you knew better than i that the yazoo pass expedition and the like could succeed 
when you got below and took port gibson grand gulf and vicinity i thought you should go down the river and join general banks and when you turned northward east of the big black i feared it was a mistake i wish now to make the personal acknowledgment that you were right and i was wrong rare is that soul which is able to see itself in the wrong and rarer still one which has the generosity to acknowledge it in october grant who had now been made a major general in the regular army as he had before been appointed to the same rank in the volunteers was placed in command of the military division of the mississippi later he defeated bragg at chattanooga november twenty fourth and twenty fifth eighteen sixty three in the memorable battles of missionary ridge and lookout mountain general halleck said in his annual report considering the strength of the rebel position and the difficulty of storming his entrenchments the battle of chattanooga must be considered the most remarkable in history not only did the officers and men exhibit great skill and daring in their operations on the field but the highest praise is due to the commanding general for his admirable dispositions for dislodging the enemy from a position apparently impregnable how our brave men fought at missionary ridge and lookout mountain has never been more graphically and touchingly told than by late lamented benjamin f taylor they dash out a little way and then slacken they creep up hand over hand loading and firing and wavering and halting from the first line of works to the second they burst into a charge with a cheer and go over it sheets of flame baptize them plunging shots tear away comrades on left and right it is no longer shoulder to shoulder it is god for us all under tree trunks among rocks stumbling over the dead struggling with the living facing the steady fire of eight thousand infantry poured down upon their heads as if it were the old historic curse from heaven they wrestle with the ridge ten fifteen twenty minutes go by like a reluctant century the batteries roll like a drum between the second and last lines of rebel works is the torrid zone of the battle the hill sways up like a wall before them at an angle of forty five degrees but our brave mountaineers are clambering steadily on up upward still they seem to be spurning the dull earth under their feet and going up to do homeric battle with the greater gods when this costly victory had been gained president lincoln appointed a day of national thanksgiving congress passed a unanimous vote of thanks to grant and his officers and men and ordered a medal to be struck in his honor his face on one side surrounded by a laurel wreath on the other side fame seated on the american eagle holding in her right hand a scroll with the words corinth vicksburg mississippi river and chattanooga early in eighteen sixty four a distinguished honor was paid him since the death of washington only one man had been appointed a lieutenant general in the army of the united states winfield scott congress now revived this grade and on march first eighteen sixty four lincoln appointed grant to this position on march ninth before the president and his cabinet his commission was formally presented to him lincoln saying as the country herein trusts you so under god it will sustain you grant now had all the union armies under his control over seven hundred thousand men when he was in the galena leather store men said his life was a failure was it a failure now and yet he was the same modest unostentatious man as when he tried farming to support his beloved family immediately grant planned two great campaigns one against richmond which was defended by lee the other against atlanta under sherman defended by joseph e johnston Sherman's march to the sea immortalized him. Grant's march to Richmond was the crowning success in the greatest of modern wars. President Lincoln reposed the utmost confidence in Grant. He wrote him, The particulars of your plans I neither know nor seek to know. You are vigilant and self-reliant, and pleased with this, I wish not to obtrude any constraints or restraints upon you. While I am very anxious that any great disaster or the capture of our men in great numbers shall be avoided, I know these points are less likely to escape your attention than they would be mine. If there is anything wanting which is within my power to give, do not fail to let me know it. And now, with a brave army and a just cause, may God sustain you. The end was coming. On May 4, 1864, Grant crossed the Rapidan with the Army of the Potomac, about 120,000 men, intending to put his forces between Lee and Richmond. Lee, perceiving this design, met the army at the wilderness, a portion of country covered by a dense forest. The undergrowth was so heavy that it was scarcely possible to see more than one hundred paces in any direction. All day long, May 5th, a bloody battle was waged in the woods. Says Private Frank Wilkeson, 
I heard the hum of bullets as they passed over the low trees. Then I noticed that small limbs of trees were falling in a feeble shower in advance of me. It was as though an army of squirrels were at work cutting off nut and pine cone laden branches, preparatory to laying in their winter store of food. Then, partially obscured by a cloud of powder smoke, I saw a straggling line of men clad in blue. They were not standing as if on parade, but they were taking advantage of the cover afforded by trees, and they were firing rapidly. Their line officers were standing behind them, or in line with them. The smoke drifted to and fro, and there were many rifts in it. We had charged, and charged, and charged again, and had gone wild with battle fever. We had gained about two miles of ground. We were doing splendidly. I cast my eyes upward to see the sun, so as to judge of the time, as I was hungry, and wanted to eat, and I saw that it was still low above the trees. The Confederates seemed to be fighting more stubbornly, fighting as though their battle line was being fed with more troops. They hung on to the ground they occupied tenaciously, and resolutely refused to fall back further. Then came a swish of bullets and a fierce, exultant yell, as of thousands of infuriated tigers. Our men fell by scores. Great gaps were struck in our lines. There was a lull for an instant, and then Longstreet's men sprang to the charge. It was swiftly and bravely made, and was within an ace of being successful. There was great confusion in our line. The men wavered badly. They fired wildly. They hesitated. The regimental officers held their men as well as they could. We could hear them close behind us, or in line with us, saying, Steady, men, steady, 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 as one speaks to frightened and excited horses. Grant says, more desperate fighting has not been witnessed on this continent than that of May 5th and 6th. The ground fought over had varied in width, but averaged three quarters of a mile. The killed and many of the severely wounded of both armies lay within this belt where it was impossible to reach them. The woods were set on fire by the bursting shells, and the conflagration raged. The wounded who had not strength to move themselves were either suffocated or burned to death. Finally, the fire communicated with our breastworks in places. Being constructed of wood, they burned with great fury, but the battle still raged, our men firing through the flames until it became too hot to remain longer. After a loss from fourteen to 15,000 men on each side, Lee remained in his entrenchments, and Grant still moved on toward Richmond. The armies met at Spotsylvania Courthouse, and here was fought one of the bloodiest battles of the war, with about the same loss as in the wilderness. Sometimes the conflict was hand-to-hand, -hand, men using their guns as clubs, being too close to fire. In one place, a tree, eighteen inches in diameter, was cut entirely down by musket balls. Grant wrote to Washington, May 11th, We have now ended the sixth day of very hard fighting. The result up to this time is much in our favor. But our losses have been heavy, as well as those of the enemy. We have lost, to this time, eleven hundred general officers killed, wounded, and missing, and probably twenty thousand men. I think the loss of the enemy must be greater. We have taken over four thousand prisoners in battle, whilst he has taken from us but few except a few stragglers. I am now sending back to Belle Plain all my wagons for a fresh supply of provisions and ammunition, and propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. After this came the battles of Drury's Bluff, North Anna, Totopotomoy, and Cold Harbor, with its brilliant assault and deadly repulse, with a loss of from ten to fourteen thousand men on the latter field. Lee had now been driven so near to Richmond, and the swamps of the Chickahominy were so impassable, that Grant determined to move his army, one hundred and fifteen thousand men, south of the James River, and attack Richmond in the rear. The move was hazardous, but he reached City Point safely. General Butler here joined him, and the siege of Petersburg, twenty miles below Richmond, began, and was continued through the winter and spring. On July 30th, 1864, a mine was exploded under one of the enemy's forts. The gallery to the mine was over five hundred feet long from where it entered the ground to the point where it was under the enemy's works. Eight chambers had been left, requiring a ton of powder each to charge them. It exploded at five o'clock in the morning, making a crater twenty feet deep and about one hundred feet in length. Instantly, one hundred and ten cannon and fifty mortars commenced work to cover our troops as they entered the enemy's lines. The effort, says Grant, was a stupendous failure. It cost us about four thousand men, mostly, however, captured, and all due to inefficiency on the part of the corps commander and the incompetency of the division commander who was sent to lead the assault. Meanwhile, Sheridan had destroyed the power of the South in the Shenandoah Valley. Again, the enemy began its march toward Richmond. 
On April 1, 1865, the Battle of Five Forks was fought, nearly 6,000 Confederates being taken prisoners, then Petersburg was captured, and on April 3rd, General Weitzel took possession of Richmond, the enemy having evacuated it, the city having been set on fire before their departure. For five days, Lee's army was pursued with more or less fighting. On April 7th, Grant wrote a letter to Lee, saying, The results of the last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of Northern Virginia in this struggle. I feel that it is so, and regard it as my duty to shift from myself the responsibility of any further effusion of blood by asking of you the surrender of that portion of the Confederate States Army known as the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee replied, I reciprocate your desire to avoid useless effusion of blood, and therefore, before considering your proposition, ask the terms you will offer on condition of its surrender. The answer came, Peace being my great desire, there is but one condition I would insist upon, namely, that the men and officers surrendered shall be disqualified for taking up arms again against the government of the United States until properly exchanged. A place of meeting was designated, and on April 9th, Grant and Lee met at the house of Mr. William McLean at Appomattox Courthouse. Grant says, when I had left camp that morning, I had not expected so soon the result that was then taking place, and consequently was in rough garb, and I was without a sword, as I usually was when on horseback on the field, and wore a soldier's blouse for a coat, with the shoulder straps of my rank to indicate to the army who I was. When I went into the house, I found General Lee. We greeted each other, and after shaking hands, took our seats. I had my staff with me, a good portion of whom were in the room during the whole of the interview. What General Lee's feelings were I do not know. As he was a man of much dignity, with an impassable face, it was impossible to say whether he felt inwardly glad that the end had finally come, or felt sad over the result, and was too manly to show it. Whatever his feelings, they were entirely concealed from my observation. But my own feelings, which had been quite jubilant on the receipt of his letter, were sad and depressed. I felt like anything, rather than rejoicing at the downfall of a foe who had fought so long and valiantly, and had suffered so much for a cause, though that cause was, I believe, one of the worst for which a people ever fought, and one for which there was the least excuse. I do not question, however, the sincerity of the great mass of those who were opposed to us. General Lee was dressed in a full uniform which was entirely new, and was wearing a sword of considerable value, very likely the sword which had been presented by the state of Virginia. At all events, it was an entirely different sword from the one that would ordinarily be worn in the field. In my rough traveling suit, the uniform of a private, with the straps of a lieutenant general, I must have contrasted very strangely with a man so handsomely dressed, six feet high, and of faultless form. But this was not a matter that I thought of until afterwards. When the terms of surrender were completed, Lee remarked that his men had been living for some days on parched corn exclusively, and asked for rations and forage, which were cordially granted. When news of the surrender first reached our lines, says Grant, our men commenced firing a salute of a hundred guns in honor of the victory. I at once sent word, however, to have it stopped. The Confederates were now our prisoners, and we did not want to exult over their downfall. True and Noble Spirit 27,516 officers and men were paroled at Appomattox. At the north, crowds came together to pray and give thanks in the churches that the war was over. Morning garb seemed to be in every house, and the joy was sanctified by tears. The Army of the Potomac marched to Washington and was disbanded June 30th. The Great War was ended. In July 1866, Congress created the rank of general for the heroic, true-hearted, grand man of quiet manner but indomitable will who had saved the Union. He was now but forty-four years of age, and what a record! Two years later, in 1868, at the Chicago Republican National Convention, Grant was unanimously nominated to the presidency. After the assassination of Lincoln, and the disagreement between Congress and Andrew Johnson in the matter of Reconstruction, it was believed that Grant would settle things. To the committee from the convention who announced his nomination to him, he said, I shall have no policy of my own to enforce against the will of the people. During the eight years of Grant's presidency, from 1869 to 1877, the country was prosperous, save the financial depression of 1873. The Alabama claims were settled, whereby our country received from Great Britain $15,500,000 damages. 
Grant favored the annexation of the island of Santo Domingo, but the measure was defeated by Congress. The International Exposition was held in Philadelphia in 1876, with an average daily attendance for five months of over 61,000 persons. While a large number of the people advocated a third term for General Grant, a nation loving freedom hesitated to establish such a precedent, and Rutherford B. Hayes was chosen president. It was well in the exciting times preceding this election, when the number of votes for Hayes and Tilden was decided by an electoral commission, that a strong hand was at the helm of state to keep the peace. After all these years of labor, General Grant determined to make the tour of the world, and, with his family and a few others, sailed for Europe May 17, 1877. From the moment they arrived on the other side of the ocean to their return, no American ever received such an ovation as Grant. Thousands crowded the docks at Liverpool, and the mayor gave an address of welcome. At Manchester, 10,000 people listened to his brief address. As I have been aware, he said, for years of the great amount of your manufactures, many of which find their ultimate destination in my own country, so I am aware that the sentiments of the great mass of the people of Manchester went out in sympathy to that country during the mighty struggle in which it fell to my lot to take some humble part. In London, the present Duke of Wellington gave him a grand banquet at Apsley House. At Marlborough House, the Prince of Wales gave him private audience. The freedom of the City of London was presented to him in a gold casket, supported by golden American eagles, standing on a velvet plinth decorated with stars and stripes. He and his family dined with the Queen at Windsor Castle. In Scotland, the freedom of the City of Edinburgh was conferred upon him. At a grand ovation at Newcastle, between forty and fifty thousand people were gathered on the moor to see the illustrious general. To the International Arbitration Union in Birmingham, he said, Nothing would afford me greater happiness than to know, as I believe will be the case, that at some future day the nations of the earth will agree upon some sort of Congress which shall take cognizance of international questions of difficulty, and whose decisions will be as binding as the decision of our Supreme Court is binding upon us. In Belgium, the king called upon him and gave a royal banquet in his honor. In Berlin, Bismarck called twice to see him, shaking hands cordially and saying, glad to welcome General Grant to Germany. In Turkey, he was presented with some beautiful Arabian horses by the Sultan. King Humbert of Italy and the Tsar of Russia showed him marked attentions. In Norway and Sweden, Spain, China, Egypt, and India, he was everywhere received as the most distinguished general of the age. On his return to America, at San Francisco and Sacramento, thousands gathered to see him. At Chicago, he said, in addressing the Army of the Tennessee, let us be true to ourselves, avoid all bitterness and all ill-feeling, either on the part of sections or parties toward each other, and we need have no fear in future of maintaining the stand we have taken among nations, so far as opposition from foreign nations goes. In Philadelphia, where he was royally entertained by his friend, Mr. George W. Childs, he said to the Grand Army of the Republic, What I want to impress upon you is that you have a country to be proud of, and a country to fight for, and a country to die for if need be. In no other country is the young and energetic man given such a chance by industry and frugality to acquire a competence for himself and family as in America. Abroad it is difficult for the poor man to make his way at all. All that is necessary is to know this in order that we may become better citizens. On his return to New York, he was presented by his friends with a home in that city, and also with the gift of $250,000. He was soon prevailed upon to enter a banking firm with Ferdinand Ward and James D. Fish. The bank failed, Grant found himself financially ruined, and the two partners were sent to prison. He was now to struggle again for a living, as in the early days in the Galena Leather Store. A timely offer came from the Century Magazine to write his experiences in the Civil War. Very simply, so that an uneducated person could understand, Grant modestly and fairly described the great battles in which he was of necessity the central figure. Unused to literary labor, he bent himself to the task, working seven and eight hours a day. On October 22, 1884, cancer developed in the throat, and for nine months Grant fought with death, till the two great volumes of his memoirs could be completed and given to the world, that his family might not be left dependent. Early in June, 1885, as he was failing rapidly, he was taken to Mount McGregor, near Saratoga, where a cottage had been offered him by Mr. Joseph W. Drexel. 
He worked now more heroically than ever, till the last page was written, with the words, The war has made us a nation of great power and intelligence. We have but little to do to preserve peace, happiness, and prosperity at home, and the respect of other nations. Our experience ought to teach us the necessity of the first, our power secures the latter. I feel that we are on the eve of a new era, where there is to be great harmony between the Federal and Confederate. I cannot stay to be a living witness to the correctness of this prophecy, but I feel it within me that it is to be so. The universally kind feeling expressed for me, at a time when it was supposed that each day would prove my last, seemed to me the beginning of the answer to, let us have peace. Night and day the nation watched for tidings from the bedside of the dying hero. At last, in July, when he knew that the end was near, he wrote an affectionate letter to the Julia Dent whom he had loved in his early manhood, and put it in his pocket that she might read it after all was over. Look after our dear children and direct them in the paths of rectitude. It would distress me far more to think that one of them could depart from an honorable, upright, and virtuous life than it would to know that they were prostrated on a bed of sickness from which they were never to arise alive. They have never given us any cause for alarm on their account, and I earnestly pray they never will. With these few injunctions and the knowledge I have of your love and affection, and of the dutiful affection of all our children, I bid you a final farewell, until we meet in another, and, I trust, a better world. You will find this on my person after my demise. Blessed home affection that brightens all the journey and makes human nature well nigh divine. On July 23, 1885, a few minutes before eight o'clock in the morning, the end came. In the midst of his children, Colonel Frederick, Ulysses, Jesse, and Nellie Grant Sartoris, and his grandchildren, his wife bending over him, he sank to rest. In every city and town in the land there was genuine sorrow. Letters of sympathy came from all parts of the world. Before the body was put in its purple casket, the eldest son placed a plain gold ring upon the little finger of the right hand, the gift years before of his wife, but which had grown too large for the emaciated finger in life. In his pocket was placed a tiny package containing a lock of Mrs. Grant's hair in a good-bye letter. Sweet and beautiful thought, to bury with our dead something which belongs to a loved one, that they may not sleep entirely alone. We shall wake and remember and understand. Let the world laugh at sentiment outwardly. The hearts of those who laugh are often hungering for affection. The body, dressed in citizen's clothes, without military, was laid in the casket. Then, in the little cottage on the mountain top, Dr. Newman, his pastor, gave a beautiful address from the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. His was the genius of common sense, enabling him to contemplate all things in their true relations, judging what is true, useful, proper, expedient, and to adopt the best means to accomplish the largest ends. From this came his seriousness, thoughtfulness, penetration, discernment, firmness, enthusiasm, triumph. Temperament without austerity, cautious without fear, brave without rashness, serious without melancholy, he was cheerful without frivolity. His constancy was not obstinacy. His adaptation was not fickleness. His hopefulness was not utopian. His love of justice was equaled only by his delight in compassion, and neither was sacrificed to the other. The keenest, closest, broadest of all observers, he was the most silent of men. He lived within himself. His thought life was most intense. His memory and his imagination were picture galleries of the world and libraries of treasured thought. He was a world to himself. His most intimate friends knew him only in part. He was fully and best known only to the wife of his bosom and the children of his loins. To them, the man of iron will and nerve of steel was gentle, tender, and confiding, and to them he unfolded his beautiful religious life. After the services, the body of the great soldier was placed upon the funeral car and conveyed to Albany, where it lay in state at the capital. At midnight, dirges were sung, while eager multitudes passed by looking upon the face of the dead. Arriving in New York, the casket was laid in the midst of exquisite flowers in the city hall. On this very day, memorial services were held in Westminster Abbey, Canon Farrar delivering an eloquent address. During the first night at City Hall, about 15,000 persons passed the coffin, and the next day, 90,000. Rich and poor, black and white, men, women, and little children. A man on crutches hobbled past the casket, bowed with grief. Move on, said one of the guards of honor. 
Yes, replied the old man, as well as I can I will. I left this leg in the wilderness. An aged woman wept as she said, O oh, General, I gave you my husband, my sons, and my son's beautiful boys. On August 8th, General Grant was laid in his tomb at Riverside Park on the Hudson River, a million people joining in the sad funeral ceremonies. The catafalque, with its black horses led by colored grooms, moved up the street, followed by a procession four miles long. When the tomb was reached, the casket, placed in a cedar covering, lead and lined, was again enclosed in a great steel casket, round like an immense boiler, weighing thirty-eight hundred pounds. The only touching memento left upon the coffin was a wreath of oak leaves, wrought together by his grandchild Julia on his dying day, with the words, To Grandpa. Guns were fired and cannon reverberated through the valley as the pallbearers, Confederate and Union generals, turned their footsteps away from the resting place of their great leader. It was fitting that North and South should unite in his burial. Here, too, will sometime be laid his wife, for before his death he exacted a promise from his oldest son, Wherever I am buried, promise me that your mother shall be buried by my side. Already she has received over three hundred thousand dollars in royalty on the memoirs which he wrote in those last months of agony. Beautifully wrote Richard Watson Gilder. All's over now, here let our captain rest. The conflict ended, past men's praise and blame. Here let him rest, alone with his great fame. Here in the city's heart he loved the best. And where our sons his tomb may see, to make them brave as he. As brave as he, he on whose iron arm our greatest leaned, our gentlest and most wise, leaned when all other help seemed mocking lies. While this one soldier checked the tide of harm, and they together saved the state, and made it free and great. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten, Part One of Famous American Statesmen by Sarah Knowles Bolton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. James A. Garfield, Part One. Not far from where I write is a tall gray stone monument in the form of a circular tower, lined with various polished marbles and exquisite stained glass windows. It stands on a hilltop in the center of three acres of green lawn looking out upon blue Lake Erie and the busy city of Cleveland, Ohio. Within this tower rests the body of one whom the nation honors, and will honor in all time to come, one who was nurtured in the wilderness that he might have a sweet, natural boyhood, who studied in the school of poverty that he might sympathize with the sons of toil, who grew to an ideal manhood that other American boys might learn the lessons of a grand life and profit by them. In the little town of Orange, Ohio, James Abram Garfield was born November 19, 1831. The home into which he came was a log cabin, twenty by thirty feet, made of unhewn logs, laid one upon another to the height of twelve feet or more, the space between the logs being filled with clay or mud. Three other children were in this home in the forest already, Mehetable, Thomas, and Mary. Abram, the father, descended from revolutionary ancestors, was a strong-bodied, strong-brained man who moved from Worcester, Otsego County, New York, to test his fortune in the wilderness. In his boyhood, he had played with Eliza Ballou, descended from Modern Ballou, a Hoganaut from France. She also, at fourteen, moved with her family from New Hampshire into the Ohio wilderness. Abram was more attracted to Ohio for that reason. They renewed the affection of their childhood, and were married February 3, 1821, settling first in Newburgh, near Cleveland, and later buying eighty acres in Orange at two dollars an acre. Here their four children were born, seven miles from any other cabin. When the boy James was eighteen months old, a shadow settled over the home in the woods. A fire broke out in the forest, threatening to sweep away the Garfield cabin. For two hours, one hot July day, the father fought the flames, took a severe cold, and died suddenly, saying to his wife, I have planted four saplings in these woods. I must now leave them to your care. He had kept his precious ones from being homeless, only to leave them fatherless. Who would have thought then that one of these saplings would grow into a mighty tree, admired by all the world? In a corner of the wheat field, in a plain box, the young husband was buried. 
what should the mother do with her helpless flock give them away said some of the relatives or bind them out in far away homes no said the brave mother and put her woman's hands to heavy work she helped her boy thomas then nine years old to split rails and fence in the wheat field she corded the wool of her sheep wove the cloth and made garments for her children she sold enough land to pay off the mortgage because she could not bear to be in debt and then she and mehetable and thomas ploughed and planted and waited in faith and hope till the harvest came when the food grew meagre she sang to her helpful children and looked ever toward brighter days and such days usually come to those who look for them it was not enough to widow garfield that her children were decently clothed and fed in this isolated home they must be educated but how a log schoolhouse was finally erected she wisely giving a corner of her farm for the site the scholars sat on split logs for benches and learned to read and write and spell as best they could from their ordinary teaching james was now nearly three and went and sat all day on the hard benches with the rest but a schoolhouse was not sufficient for these new england pioneers they must have a church building where they could worship mrs garfield loved her bible and had taught her children daily so that james even knew its stories by heart and many of its chapters a church was therefore organized in the log schoolhouse and now they could work happily year after year wondering perchance what the future would bring James began to show great fondness for reading. As he lay on the cabin floor, by the big fireplace, he read by its light his English reader, Robinson Crusoe, again and again, and later, when he was twelve, Josephus and Goodrich's History of the United States. He had worked on the farm for years. Now he must earn some money for his mother by work for the neighbors. He had helped his brother Thomas in enlarging the house, and was sure that he could be a carpenter going to a mr trent he asked for work there is a pile of boards that i want plain said the man and i will pay you one cent a board for planing james began at once and at the end of a long day to the amazement of mr trent he had planed one hundred boards each over twelve feet long and proudly carried home one dollar to his mother after this he helped to build a barn and a shed for a potashery establishment for leaching ashes the manufacturer of the black salts seemed to take a fancy to the lad and offered him work at nine dollars a month and his board which james accepted in the evenings he studied arithmetic and read books about the sea this arrangement might have continued for some time had not the daughter of the salt maker remarked one evening to her beau as they sat in the room where james was reading i should think it was time for hired servants to be abed James had not realized how the presence of a third party is apt to restrain the confidential conversation of lovers. He was hurt and angered by the words, and the next day gave up his work and went home to his mother, to receive her sympathy and find employment elsewhere. Doubtless he was more careful all his life from this circumstance, lest he wound the feelings of others. Soon after this he heard that his uncle in Newburgh was hiring woodchoppers. He immediately went to see him, and agreed to cut one hundred cords of wood at twenty-five cents a cord. It was a man's work, but the boy of sixteen determined to do as much as a man. Each day he cut two cords, and at last carried twenty-five dollars to his mother, a small fortune, it seemed, to the earnest boy. When he chopped wood he looked out wistfully upon Lake Erie, recalled the sea stories which he had read, and longed more than ever to become a sailor. The orange woods were growing too cramped for him, he was restless and eager for a broader life. It was the unrest of ambition which voiced itself twenty years later in an address at Washington, D.C., to young men. Occasion cannot make spurs, young men. If you expect to wear spurs, you must win them. If you wish to use them, you must buckle them to your own heels before you go into the fight. Any success you may achieve is not worth the having unless you fight for it. Whatever you win in life, you must conquer by your own efforts and then it is yours, a part of yourself. Let not poverty stand as an obstacle in your way. Poverty is uncomfortable, as I can testify, but nine times out of ten the best thing that can happen to a young man is to be tossed overboard and compelled to sink or swim for himself. In all my acquaintance I have never known one to be drowned who was worth saving. To a young man who has in himself the magnificent possibilities of life, it is not fitting that he should be permanently commanded, 
he should be a commander you must not continue to be employed you must be an employer you must be promoted from the ranks to a command there is something young men that you can command go and find it and command it you can at least command a horse and dray can be generalissimo of them and may carve out a fortune with them mrs garfield with her mother's heart deprecated a life at sea for her boy and tried to dissuade him through the summer he worked in the hayfield and then the sea fever returning his mother wisely suggested that he seek employment on lake erie and see if he liked the life with his clothing wrapped in a bundle he walked seventeen miles to cleveland with glowing visions of being a sailor reaching the wharf he went on board a schooner and asked for work a drunken captain met him with oaths and ordered him off the boat the first phase of sea life had been different from what he had read in the books and he turned away somewhat disheartened however he soon met a cousin who gave him the opportunity of driving mules for a canal boat to walk beside slow mules was somewhat prosaic as compared with climbing masts in a storm but he accepted the position receiving ten dollars a month and his board says william m thayer in his from log cabin to the white house james appeared to possess a singular affinity for the water he fell into the water fourteen times during the two or three months he served on the canal boat it was not because he was so clumsy that he could not keep right side up nor because he did not understand the business rather we think it arose from his thorough devotion to his work he gave more attention to the labor in hand than he did to his own safety he was one who never thought of himself when he was serving another he thought only of what he had in hand to do his application was intense and his perseverance royal after a few weeks he contracted fever and ague and went home to be cared for by his mother through nearly five months of illness the sea fever had somewhat abated could he not go to school again urged the mother thomas and she could give him seventeen dollars not much to be sure for some people but much for the widow and her son at last he decided to go to Giaga Seminary at Chester, a decision which took him to the presidential chair. March 5, 1849, when he was 18, James and his cousin started on foot for Chester, carrying their household utensils, plates, knives and forks, kettle and the like, for they must board themselves. A small room was hired for a pittance, four boys rooming together. The seventeen dollars soon melted away, and James found work in a carpenter's shop, where he labored nights and mornings and every Saturday. Though especially fond of athletic games, he had no time for these. The school library contained one hundred and fifty volumes, a perfect mine of knowledge, it seemed to the youth from Orange. He read eagerly biography and history, joined the debating society, where, despite his awkward manners and poor clothes, his eloquence soon attracted attention went home to see his mother at the end of the first term, happy and courageous, and returned with ninepence in his pocket to renew the struggle for an education. The first Sunday, at church, he put this ninepence into the contribution box, probably feeling no poorer than before. While at Chester, the early teaching of his mother bore fruit, in his becoming a Christian, and joining the sect called Disciples. Of course, said Garfield years later, that settled canal and lake and sea and everything. A new life had begun, a life devoted to the highest endeavor. Each winter, while at Chester, he taught a district school, winning the love of the pupils by his enthusiasm and warm heart, and inciting them to study from his love of books. He played with them as though a boy, like themselves, as he was in reality, and yet demanded and received perfect obedience. He boarded around as was the custom, and thus learned more concerning both parents and pupils than was always desirable, probably. But in every house he tried to stimulate all to increased intelligence. During his last term at the seminary, he met a graduate of a New England college, who urged that he also attend college, told how often men had worked their way through successfully and had come to prominence. Young Garfield at once began to study Latin and Greek, and at twenty years of age, presented himself at Hiram College, Ohio, a small institution at that time, which had been started by the disciples. He sought the principal and asked to ring the bell and sweep the floors to help pay his expenses. He took a room with four other students, not a wise plan, except for one who has will enough to study whether his companions work or play, and rose at five in the morning to ring his bell. A lady who attended the college thus writes of him, 
I can see him even now, standing in the morning with his hand on the bell rope, ready to give the signal calling teachers and scholars to engage in the duties of the day. As we passed by, entering the schoolroom, he had a cheerful word for everyone. He was probably the most popular person in the institution. He was always good-natured, fond of conversation, and very entertaining. He was witty and quick at repartee, but his jokes, though brilliant and sparkling, were always harmless, and he never would willingly hurt another's feelings. Afterward, he became an assistant teacher, and while pursuing his classical studies, preparatory to his college course, he taught the English branches. He was a most entertaining teacher, ready with illustrations, and possessing in a marked degree the power of exciting the interests of the scholars, and afterward making clear to them the lessons. In the arithmetic class there were ninety pupils, and I cannot remember a time when there was any flagging in the interest. There were never any cases of unruly conduct, or a disposition to shirk. With scholars who were slow of comprehension, or to whom recitations were a burden, on account of their modest or retiring dispositions, he was specially attentive, and by encouraging words and gentle assistance, would manage to put all at their ease, and awaken in them a confidence in themselves. He was a constant attendant at the regular meetings for prayer, and his vigorous exhortations and apt remarks upon the Bible lessons were impressive and interesting. There was a cordiality in his disposition which won quickly the favor and esteem of others. He had a happy habit of shaking hands, and would give a hearty grip which betokened a kind-hearted feeling for all. One of his gifts was that of mezzotint drawing, and he gave instruction in this branch. I was one of his pupils in this, and have now the picture of a cross upon which he did some shading and put on the finishing touches. Upon the margin is written, in the hand of the noted teacher, his own name and his pupils. There are also two other drawings, one of a large European bird on the bough of a tree, and the other a churchyard scene in winter, done by him at that time. In those days the faculty and pupils were wont to call him the second Webster, and the remark was common, he will fill the White House yet. In the Lyceum he early took rank far above the others as a speaker and debater. During the month of June the entire school went in carriages in their annual grove meeting at Randolph, some twenty-five miles away. On this trip he was the life of the party, occasionally bursting out in an eloquent strain at the sight of a bird or a trailing vine, or a venerable giant of the forest. He would repeat poetry by the hour, having a very retentive memory. The college library contained about two thousand volumes, and here Garfield read systematically and topically, a habit which continued through life and made him master of every subject which he touched. Tennyson's poetry became, like the Bible, his daily study. Mr. J. M. Bundy, in his Life of Garfield, said, years later, His house at Washington is a workshop, in which the tools are always kept within immediate reach. Although books overrun his house from top to bottom, his library contains the working material on which he mainly depends. And the amount of material is enormous. Large numbers of scrapbooks that have been accumulating over twenty years in number and value, made up with an eye to what either is or may become useful, which would render the collection of priceless value to the library of any first-class newspaper establishment, are so perfectly arranged and indexed that their owner, with his all-retentive memory, can turn in a moment to the facts that may be needed for almost any conceivable emergency in debate. These are supplemented by diaries that preserve Garfield's multifarious political, scientific, literary, and religious inquiries, studies, and readings. And to make the machinery of rapid work complete, he has a large box containing 63 different drawers, each properly labeled, in which he places newspaper cuttings, documents, and slips of paper, and from which he can pull out what he wants as easily as an organist can play on the stops of his instrument. In Hiram College he formed an intellectual friendship with a fellow student to whose inspiring help he testified gratefully to the end of his life, Miss Almeda A. Booth, eight years his senior, a brilliant and noble woman, pledged to virgin widowhood by the death of the young man to whom she was promised in marriage. Twenty years later, Garfield said, in a memorial address at Hiram College, On my own behalf I take this occasion to say that for her generous and powerful aid, so often and so efficiently rendered, for her quick and never-failing sympathy, and for her intelligent, unselfish, and unswerving friendship, 
I owe her a debt of gratitude and affection, for the payment of which the longest term of life would have been too short. I remember that she and I were members of the class that began Xenophon's Anabasis in the fall of 1852. Near the close of that term, I also began to teach the Eclectic College, and thereafter, like her, could keep up my studies only outside of my own class hours. In mathematics and the physical sciences, I was far behind her, but we were nearly at the same place in Greek and Latin, each having studied them about three terms. She had made her home at President Hayden's almost from the first, and I became a member of his family at the beginning of the winter term of 1852-53. Thereafter, for only two years, she and I studied together and recited in the same classes, frequently without other associates, till we had nearly completed the classical course. During the fall of 1853, she read 100 pages of Herodotus and about the same of Livy. During that term also, Professors Dunshee and Hall, Miss Booth, and I met at her room two evenings of each week to make a joint translation of the Book of Romans. Professor Dunshee contributed his studies of the German commentators De Witt and Tholuck, and each of the translators made some special study for each meeting. How nearly we completed the translation I do not remember, but I do remember that the contributions and criticisms of Miss Booth were remarkable for suggestiveness and sound judgment. Our work was more thorough than rapid, for I find this entry in my diary for December 15, 1853. Translation Society sat three hours at Miss Booth's room and agreed upon the translation of nine verses. During the winter term of 1853-54, she continued to read Livy and also the whole of Demosthenes on the Crown. During the spring term of 1854, she read the Germania and Agricola of Tacitus and a portion of Hesiod. To Garfield, she was another Margaret Fuller. I venture to assert that in native powers of mind, in thoroughness and breadth of scholarship, in womanly sweetness of spirit, and in the quantity and quality of effective, unselfish work done, she has not been excelled by any American woman. I could name twenty or thirty books which will forever be doubly precious to me because they were read and discussed in company with her. She was always ready to aid any friend with her best efforts. When I was in the hurry of preparing for a debate with Mr. Denton in 1858, she read not less than eight or ten volumes, and made admirable notes for me on those points which related to the topics of discussion. In the autumn of 1859, she read a large portion of Blackstone's commentaries, and enjoyed with keenest relish the strength of the author's thought and the beauty of his style. From the rich stores of her knowledge she gave the unselfish generosity. The foremost students had no managed pride that made them hesitate to ask her assistance and counsel. In preparing their opinions and debates, they eagerly sought her suggestions and criticisms. It is quite probable that John Stuart Mill has exaggerated the extent to which his own mind and works were influenced by Harriet Mill. I should reject his opinion on that subject as a delusion that I not know from my own experience as well as that of hundreds of Hiram students, how great a power Miss Booth exercised over the culture and opinions of her friends. The influence of such a woman upon an intellectual young man can scarcely be estimated, or overestimated. The world is richer and nobler for such women. Garfield never forgot her influence. The year he died, he said at a Williams College banquet held in Cleveland, January 10, 1881, I am glad to say, reverently, in the presence of the many ladies here tonight, that I owe to a woman who has long since been asleep, perhaps a higher debt intellectually than I owe to anyone else. After that comes my debt to Williams College. He used to say, Give me a log hut with only a simple bench, Mark Hopkins on one end and I on the other, and you may have all the buildings, apparatus, and libraries without him. After two years at Hiram College, Garfield decided to enter some eastern college and wrote to Yale, Brown, and Williams. Their replies are shown in his letter to a friend at this time. Their answers are now before me. All tell me I can graduate in two years. They are all brief business notes, but President Hopkins concludes with this sentence, If you come here, we shall be glad to do what we can for you. Other things being so nearly equal, this sentence, which seems to be a kind of friendly grasp of the hand, has settled the question for me. I shall start for Williams next week. A kind sentence gave to Williams a distinguished honor for all coming years. 
Garfield had not only paid his way while at Hiram, but he had saved three hundred and fifty dollars for his course at Williams. Here he earned money, as he had at Hiram, by teaching, and borrowed a few hundreds from Dr. J. P. Robinson of Cleveland, Ohio, offering a life insurance policy as security. In college, says Dr. Hopkins, as General Garfield was broad in his scholarship, so was he in his sympathies. No one thought of him as a recluse or as bookish. Not given to athletic sports, he was fond of them. His mind was open to the impression of natural scenery, and, as his constitution was vigorous, he knew well to find points on the mountains around us. He was also social in his disposition, both giving and inspiring confidence. So true is this of his intercourse with the officers of the college, as well as with others, that he was never even suspected of anything low or trickish. General Garfield gave himself to study with a zest and delight wholly unknown to those who find in it a routine. A religious man and a man of principle, he pursued of his own accord the ends proposed by the institution. He was prompt, frank, manly, social in his tendencies, combining active exercise with habits of study, and thus did for himself what is the object of a college to enable every young man to do. He made himself a man. When Garfield was at Williams, the slavery question had become the exciting topic of the day. Preston Brooks's attack on Charles Sumner had aroused the indignation of the students who called a meeting at which Garfield made an eloquent and powerful speech. At his graduation in 1856, when he was twenty-five, he delivered the metaphysical oration, the highest honor awarded. He now returned to Hiram College, having been appointed professor of Greek and Latin. At once he began his work with zest. He said later, I have taken more solid comfort in the thing itself, and received more moral recompense and stimulus in after life from capturing young men for an education than from anything else in the world. As I look back over my life thus far, I think of nothing that so fills me with pleasure as the planning of these sieges, the revolving in my mind of plans for scaling the walls of the fortress, of gaining access to the inner soul life, and at last seeing the besieged party won to a fuller appreciation of himself, to a higher conception of life, and of the part he is to bear in it. The principal guards which I have found it necessary to overcome in gaining these victories are the parents or guardians of the young men themselves. I particularly remember two such instances of capturing young men from their parents. Both of those boys are today educators of wide reputation. One president of a college, the other high in the ranks of graded school managers. Neither, in my opinion, would today have been above the commonest walks of life unless I, or someone else, had captured him. There is a period in every young man's life when a very small thing will turn him one way or the other. He is distrustful of himself and uncertain as to what he should do. His parents are poor, perhaps, and argue that he has more education than they ever obtained, and that it is enough. These parents are sometimes a little too anxious in regard to what their boys are going to do when they get through with their college course. They talk to the young man too much, and I have noticed that the boy who will make the best man is sometimes most ready to doubt himself. I always remember the turning period in my own life, and pity a young man at this stage from the bottom of my heart. One of the young men I referred to came to me on the closing day of the spring term, and bade me good-bye at my study. I noticed that he awkwardly lingered after I expected him to go, and had turned to my writing again. I suppose you will be back again in the fall, Henry, I said, to fill in the vacuum. He did not answer, and, turning toward him, I noticed that his eyes were filled with tears, and that his countenance was undergoing contortions of pain. He at length managed to stammer out, No, I am not coming back to Hiram any more. Father says I have got education enough, and that he needs me to work on the farm that education don't help along a farmer any. Is your father here? I asked, almost as much affected by the statement as the boy himself. He was a peculiarly bright boy, one of those strong, awkward, bashful, blonde, large-headed fellows, such as make men. He was not a prodigy by any means, but he knew what work meant, and, when he had won a thing by true endeavor, he knew its value. Yes, father is here, and is taking my things home for good, said the boy, more affected than ever. Well, don't feel badly, I said. Please tell him Mr. Garfield would like to see him at his study before he leaves the village. Don't tell him that it is about you, but simply that I want to see him. 
In the course of half an hour the old gentleman, a robust specimen of a Western Reserve Yankee, came into the room and awkwardly sat down. I knew something of the man before, and I thought I knew how to begin. I shot right at the bull's-eye immediately. So you have come up to take Henry home with you, have you? The old gentleman answered yes. I sent for you because I wanted to have a little talk with you about Henry's future. He is coming back again in the fall, I hope. Well, I think not. I don't reckon I can afford to send him any more. He's got education enough for a farmer already, and I notice that when they get too much they sorter of get lazy. Your educated farmers are humbugs. Henry's got so far along now that he'd rather heave his head in a book than be workin'. He don't take no interest in the stock nor in the farm improvements. Everybody else is dependent in this world on the farmer, and I think we've got too many educated fellows setting around now for the farmers to support. I am sorry to hear you talk so, I said, for really I consider Henry one of the brightest and most faithful students I have ever had. I have taken a very deep interest in him. What I wanted to say to you was that the matter of educating him has largely been a constant outgo thus far. If he is permitted to come next fall term, he will be far enough advanced so that he can teach school in the winter and begin to help himself and you along. He can earn very little on the farm in the winter, and he can get very good wages teaching. How does that strike you? The idea was a new and good one to him. He simply remarked, Do you really think he can teach next winter? I should think so, certainly, I replied, but, if he cannot do so then, he can in a short time anyhow. Well, I will think on it. He wants to come back bad enough, and I guess I'll have to let him. I never thought of it that way afore. I knew I was safe. It was the financial question that troubled the old gentleman, and I knew that would be overcome when Henry got to teaching and could earn his money himself. He would then be so far along, too, that he could fight his own battles. He came all right the next fall, and, after finishing at Hiram, graduated at an eastern college. End of Chapter 10, Part 1「A Famous American Statesman » by Sarah Knowles Bolton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. James A. Garfield Part 2 One secret of Garfield's success in teaching was his deep interest in the young. He said, I feel a profounder reverence for a boy than for a man. I never meet a ragged boy of the street without feeling that I owe him a salute, for I know not what possibilities may be buttoned up under his shabby coat. When I meet you in the full flush of mature life, I see nearly all there is of you. But among these boys are the great men of the future, the heroes of the next generation, the philosophers, the statesmen, the philanthropists, the great reformers and molders of the next age. Therefore, I say, there is a peculiar charm to me in the exhibitions of young people engaged in the business of an education. He made himself a student with his students. He said, I shall give you a series of lectures upon history, beginning next week. I do this not alone to assist you. The preparation for the lectures will compel me to study history. He was always a worker. When I get into a place that I can easily fill, I always feel like shoving out of it into one that requires of me more exertion. His active mind was not content with teaching. He delivered lectures in the neighboring towns on geology, illustrated by charts of his own making, upon Walter Scott, Carlyle's Frederick the Great, the character of the German people, government, and the topics of the times. He preached almost every Sabbath in some disciple church. A year after his return from Williams, he was promoted to the presidency of Hiram College. In 1858, when he was 27, he married Lucretia Rudolph, whom he had known at Giaga Cemetery, and who was his pupil in Latin and Greek at Hiram. He had been engaged to her four years previously, when he entered Williams, she being a year his junior. She was his companion in study as well as domestic life, and helped him onward in his great career. This same year, 1858, he entered his name as a student at law with a Cleveland firm carrying on his studies at home, and fitted himself for the bar in the usual time devoted by those who have no other work in hand. The following year, having taken an active part in the Republican campaign for John C. Fremont for the presidency, Garfield was chosen state senator. The same year, Williams College invited him to deliver the master's oration on commencement day. On the journey thither, he visited Quebec, taking with his wife their first pleasure trip. 
Only eight years before this he was ringing the bell at Hiram. Promotion had come rapidly, but deservedly. In the legislature he naturally took a prominent part. Lincoln had been elected, and had issued his call for 75,000 men. Garfield, in an eloquent speech, moved that Ohio contribute 20,000 men and $3 million as the quota of the state. The motion was enthusiastically carried. Governor Dennison appointed Garfield colonel of the 42nd Ohio Regiment, and he left the Senate for the battlefield, nearly 100 Hiram students enlisting under him. At once he began to study military tactics in earnest. He organized a school among the officers and kept the men at drill till they were efficient in the art of war. January 10, 1862, he fought the Battle of Middle Creek with 1,100 men, driving General Marshall out of eastern Kentucky with 5,000 men. The battle raged for five hours, sometimes a desperate hand-to-hand -hand fight. General Buell said in his official report of Garfield and his regiment, they have overcome formidable difficulties in the character of the country, the condition of the roads, and the inclemency of the season, and, without artillery, having several engagements terminating in the Battle of Middle Creek, driven the enemy from his entrenched positions and forced him back into the mountains, with the loss of a large amount of baggage and stores, and many of his men killed and captured. These services have called into action the highest qualities of a soldier, fortitude, perseverance, and courage. After this battle, President Lincoln made Garfield a Brigadier General. Says Mr. Bundy, having cleared out Humphrey Marshall's forces, Garfield moved his command to Piketon, 120 miles above the mouth of the Big Sandy, from which place he covered the whole region about with expeditions, breaking up rebel camps and perfecting his work. Finally, in that poor and wretched country, his supplies gave out, and as usual, taking care of the most important matter himself, he went to the Ohio River for supplies, got them, seized a steamer, and loaded it. But there was an unprecedented freshet, navigation was very perilous, and no captain or pilot could be induced to take charge of the boat. Garfield at once availed himself of his canal boat experience, took charge of the boat, stood at the helm for forty out of forty-eight hours, piloted the steamer through an untried channel full of dangerous eddies and wild currents, and saved his command from starvation. Later, Garfield became chief of General Rosecrans' staff, was in the dreadful battle at Chickamauga, and was made Major General for gallant and meritorious services in that battle. Rosecrans said, All my staff merited my warm approbation for ability, zeal, and devotion to duty, but I am sure they will not consider it invidious if I especially mention Brigadier General Garfield, ever active, prudent, and sagacious. I feel much indebted to him for both counsel and assistance in the administration of this army. He possesses the energy and the instinct of a great commander. In the summer of 1862, the 19th Congressional District of Ohio elected Garfield to Congress. He hesitated about leaving the army, but, being urged by his friends that it was his duty to serve his country in the House of Representatives, he took his seat December 1863. Among such men as Colfax, Washburn, Conkling, Allison, and others, he at once took an honorable position. He was made chairman of military affairs, then of banking and currency, of approbations, and other committees. On the slavery question, he had always been outspoken. He said on the constitutional amendment abolishing slavery, All along the coast of our political sea, these victims of slavery lie like stranded wrecks broken on the headlands of freedom. How lately did its advocates, with impious boldness, maintain it as God's own, to be venerated and cherished as divine. It was another and higher form of civilization. It was the holy evangel of America dispensing its mercies to a benighted race, and destined to bear countless blessings to the wilderness of the West. In its mad arrogance it lifted its hand to strike down the fabric of the Union, and since that fatal day it has been a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. Like the spirit that Jesus cast out, it has since then been seeking rest and finding none. It has sought in all the corners of the Republic to find some hiding place in which to shelter itself from the death it so richly deserves. It sought an asylum in the untrodden territories of the West, but with a whip of scorpions, indignant free men drove it thence. I do not believe that a loyal man can now be found who would consent that it should again enter them. It has no hope of harbor there. 
it found no protection or favor in the hearts or consciences of the free men of the republic and has fled for its last hope of safety behind the shield of the constitution we propose to follow it there and drive it thence as satan was exiled from heaven to me it is a matter of great surprise that gentlemen on the other side should wish to delay the death of slavery i can only account for it on the ground of long continued familiarity and friendship has she not betrayed and slain men enough are they not strewn over a thousand battlefields is not this moloch already gorged with the bloody feast its best friends know that its final hour is fast approaching the avenging gods are on its track their feet are not now as of old shod with wool nor slow and stately stepping but winged like mercury's to bear the swift message of vengeance no human power can avert the final catastrophe on the currency he spoke repeatedly and earnestly he carefully studied english financial history and mastered the french and german languages that he might study their works on political economy and finance says captain f h mason late of the forty second ohio regiment in his sketch of garfield in may eighteen sixty eight when the country was rapidly drifting into a hopeless confusion of ideas on financial subjects and when several prominent statesmen had come forward with specious plans for creating absolute money by putting the government stamp upon banknotes and for paying off with this false currency the bonds which the nation had solemnly agreed to pay in gold general garfield stood up almost single-handed and faced the current with a speech which any statesman of this century might be proud to have written on his monument it embraced twenty-three distinct but concurrent topics and occupied in delivering an entire day's session of the house for my own part he said my course is taken in view of all the facts of our situation of all the terrible experiences of the past both at home and abroad and of the united testimony of the wisest and bravest statesmen who have lived and labored during the past century it is my firm conviction that any considerable increase of the volume of our inconvertible paper money will shatter public credit will paralyze public industry and oppress the poor and that the gradual restoration of our ancient standard of value will lead us by the safest and surest paths to national prosperity and the steady pursuits of peace again he said i for one am not willing that my name shall be linked to the fate of a paper currency i believe that any party which commits itself to paper money will go down amid the general disaster covered with the curses of a ruined people mr speaker i remember that on the monument of queen elizabeth where her glories were recited and her honors summed up among the last and the highest recorded as the climax of her honors was this that she had restored the money of her kingdom to its just value and when this house shall have done its work when it shall have brought back values to their proper standard it will deserve a monument on the tariff question general garfield took the side of protection yet was no extremist his oft reiterated belief was as an abstract theory the doctrine of free trade seems to be universally true but as a question of practicability under a government like ours their protective system seems to be indispensable he said in congress we have seen that one extreme school of economists would place the price of all manufactured articles in the hands of foreign producers by rendering it impossible for our manufacturers to compete with them while the other extreme school by making it impossible for the foreigner to sell his competing wares in our market would give the people no immediate check upon the prices which our manufacturers might fix for their products i disagree with both these extremes i hold that a properly adjusted competition between home and foreign products is the best gauge by which to regulate international trade duties should be so high that our manufacturers can fairly compete with the foreign product but not so high as to enable them to drive out the foreign article enjoy a monopoly of the trade and regulate the price as they please this is my doctrine of protection if congress pursues this line of policy steadily we shall year by year approach more nearly to the basis of free trade because we shall be more nearly able to compete with other nations on equal terms i am for a protection which leads to ultimate free trade i am for that free trade which can only be achieved through a reasonable protection if all the kingdoms of the world should become the kingdom of the prince of peace then i admit that universal free trade ought to prevail but that blessed era is yet too remote to be made the basis of the practical legislation of today. we are not yet members of the parliament of man the federation of the world 
For the present, the world is divided into separate nationalities, and that other divine command still applies to our situation. He that provideth not for his own household has denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. And until that latter era arrives, patriotism must supply the place of universal brotherhood. Again he said, Those arts that enable our nation to rise in the scale of civilization bring their blessings to all, and patriotic citizens will cheerfully bear a fair share of the burden necessary to make our country great and self-sustaining. I will defend a tariff that is national in its aims, that protects and sustains those interests without which the nation cannot become great and self-sustaining. So important, in my view, is the ability of the nation to manufacture all these articles necessary to arm, equip, and clothe our people, that if it could not be secured in any other way, I would vote to pay money out of the federal treasury to maintain government iron and steel, woolen and cotton mills, at whatever cost. Were we to neglect these great interests and depend upon other nations, in what a condition of helplessness would we find ourselves when we should be again involved in war with the very nations on whom we were depending to furnish us these supplies? The system adopted by our fathers is wiser, for it so encourages the great national industries as to make it possible at all times for our people to equip themselves for war and at the same time increase their intelligence and skill so as to make them better fitted for all the duties of citizenship in war and in peace. We provide for the common defense by a system which promotes the general welfare. I believe that we ought to seek that point of stable equilibrium somewhere between a prohibitory tariff on the one hand and a tariff that gives no protection on the other. What is that point of stable equilibrium? In my judgment, it is this, a rate so high that foreign producers cannot flood our markets and break down our home manufacturers, but not so high as to keep them altogether out, enabling our manufacturers to combine and raise the prices, nor so high as to stimulate an unnatural and unhealthy growth of manufactures. In other words, I would have the duty so adjusted that every great American industry can fairly live and make fair profits, and yet so low that if our manufacturers attempted to put up prices unreasonably, the competition from abroad would come in and bring down prices to a fair rate. On special occasions, such as his eulogies on Lincoln and General Thomas, and on Decoration Day at Arlington Heights, Garfield was very eloquent. At the latter place, he said, If silence is ever golden, it must be here, beside the graves of fifteen thousand men, whose lives were more significant than speech, and whose death was a poem, the music of which can never be sung. With words we make promises, plight faith, praise virtue. Promises may not be kept, plighted faith may be broken, and vaunted virtue may be only the cunning mask of vice. We do not know one promise these men made, one pledge they gave, one word they spoke, but we do know they summed up and perfected, by one supreme act, the highest virtues of men and citizens. For love of country they accepted death, and thus resolved all doubts, and made immortal their patriotism and their virtue. For the noblest man that lives, there still remains a conflict. He must still withstand the assaults of time and fortune must still be assailed with temptations before which lofty natures have fallen. But with these, the conflict ended, the victory was won, when death stamped on them the great seal of heroic character, and closed a record which years can never blot. Professor B. A. Hinsdale, the intimate friend of Garfield, says, in his Hiram College Memorial, General Garfield's readiness on all occasions has often been remarked. Probably some have attributed this readiness to the inspiration of genius. The explanation lies partly in his genius, but much more in his indefatigable work. He treasured up knowledge of all kinds. You never know, he would say, how soon you will need it. Then he forecasted occasions and got ready to meet them. One hot day in July, 1876, he brought to his Washington house an old copy of the Congressional Globe. Questioned, he said, I have been told, confidentially, that Mr. Lammer is going to make a speech in the House on general politics to influence the presidential canvass. If he does, I shall reply to him. Mr. Lammer was a member of the House before the war, and I am going to read some of his old speeches and get into his mind. Mr. Lammer made his speech August 2nd, and Mr. Garfield replied August 4th. Men expressed surprise at the fullness and completeness of the reply delivered on such short notice 
but to one knowing his habits of mind, especially to one who had the aforesaid conversation with him, the whole matter was as light as day. His genius was emphatically the genius of preparation. Both in Congress and in the Army, Garfield gave a portion of each day to the classics, especially to his favorite, Horace. He was always an omnivorous reader. In 1880, he was elected United States Senator. After the election, he said, during the twenty years that I have been in public life, almost eighteen of it in the Congress of the United States, I have tried to do one thing. Whether I was mistaken or otherwise, it has been the plan of my life to follow my convictions, at whatever personal cost to myself. I have represented for many years a district in Congress whose approbation I greatly desired. But, though it may seem, perhaps, a little egotistical to say it, I yet desired still more the approbation of one person, and his name was Garfield. He is the only man that I am compelled to sleep with, and eat with, and live with, and die with, and if I could not have his approbation, I should have had bad companionship. All these years the home life had been helpful and beautiful. Of his seven children, two were sleeping in the Hiram churchyard. Five, Harry, James, Molly, Irvin, and Abram, made the Washington home a place of cheer in winter, and the summer home at Mentor, Ohio, a few miles from Hiram, a place of rest and pleasure. Here Garfield, beloved by his neighbors, plowed and sowed and reaped, as when a boy. His mother lived in his family, happy in his success. When the National Republican Convention met in June 1880 at Chicago, the names of several presidential candidates came before the people, Grant, Blaine, and others. Garfield nominated John Sherman of Ohio in a chaste and eloquent speech. He said, I have witnessed the extraordinary scenes of this convention with deep solicitude. No emotion touches my heart more quickly than a sentiment in honor of a great and noble character. But as I sat on these seats and witnessed these demonstrations, it seemed to me you were a human ocean in a tempest. I have seen the sea lashed into fury and tossed into spray, and its grandeur moves the soul of the dullest man. But I remember that it is not the billows, but the calm level of the sea from which all heights and depths are measured. When the storm has passed and the hour of calm settles on the ocean, when the sunlight bathes its smooth surface, then the astronomer and surveyor takes the level from which he measures all terrestrial heights and depths. Gentlemen of the Convention, your present temper may not mark the healthful pulse of our people. When our enthusiasm has passed, when the emotions of this hour have subsided, we shall find that calm level of public opinion below the storm from which the thoughts of a mighty people are to be measured, and by which their final action will be determined. Not here, in this brilliant circle, where fifteen thousand men and women are assembled, is the destiny of the Republican Party to be decreed. Not here, where I see the enthusiastic faces of seven hundred and fifty-six delegates, waiting to cast their votes into the urn and determine the choice of the Republic, but by four million Republican firesides, where the thoughtful voters, with wives and children about them, with the calm thoughts inspired by love of home and country, with the history of the past, the hopes of the future, and reverence for the great men who have adorned and blessed our nation in days gone by, burning in their hearts. There God prepares the verdict which will determine the wisdom of our work tonight, not in Chicago in the heat of June, but at the ballot boxes of the Republic in the quiet of November, after the silence of deliberate judgment will this question be settled. The thousands were at fever heat hour after hour in their intense excitement. After thirty-four ineffectual ballots, on the thirty-fifth, fifty votes were given for Garfield. The tide had turned at last. The delegates of state after state gathered around the man from Ohio, holding their flags over him, while their hands played, rally round the flag boys, and fifteen thousand people shouted their thanksgiving for the happy choice. Outside the great hall, cannons were fired, and the crowded streets sent up their cheers. From that moment, Garfield belonged to the nation, and was its idol. On March 4, 1881, in the presence of a hundred thousand people, the boy born in the Orange Wilderness was inaugurated President of the United States. None of us who were present will ever forget the beauty of his address from the steps of the National Capitol, or the kiss given to white-haired mother and devoted wife at the close. Afterward, the great procession, three hours in passing a given point, was reviewed by President Garfield from a stand erected in front of the White House. Four months after this scene, on July 2, 1881, the nation was thrilled with sorrow. 
as General Garfield and his Secretary of State, James G. Blaine, arm in arm, were entering the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Depot, two pistol shots were fired, one passing through Garfield's coat sleeve, the other into his body. He fell heavily to the floor and was borne to the White House. The assassin was Charles Guiteau, a half-crazed aspirant for office, entirely unknown to the President. The man was hanged. Through four long months the nation prayed and hoped and agonized for the life of its beloved president. Gifts poured in from every part of the Union, but gifts were of no avail. On September 5th, Garfield was carried to Elberon, Long Branch, New Jersey, where, in the Franklin Cottage, he seemed to revive as he looked out upon the sea, the sea he had longed for in his boyhood. The nation took heart, but two weeks later, at thirty-five minutes past ten, on the evening of September 19th, the anniversary of the Battle of Chickamauga, the President passed from an unconscious state to the consciousness of immortality. At ten minutes past ten, he had said to General Swain, who was standing beside him, as he put his hand upon his heart, I have great pain here. The whole world sympathized with America in her great sorrow. Queen Victoria telegraphed to Mrs. Garfield, Words cannot express the deep sympathy I feel with you at this terrible moment. May God support and comfort you as he alone can. On September 21st, the body of the President was taken to Washington. At the Princeton Station, 300 students from the college, with uncovered heads, strewed the track and covered the funeral car with flowers. At the Capitol, where he had so recently listened to the cheers of the people at his inauguration, 100,000 passed in silence before his open coffin. The casket was covered with flowers, one wreath bearing a card from England's Queen with the words, Queen Victoria, to the memory of the late President Garfield, an expression of her sorrow and sympathy with Mrs. Garfield and the American nation. The body was borne to Cleveland, the whole train of cars being draped in black. Fifty thousand persons assembled at the station and followed the casket to a catafalque on the public square. During the Sabbath, an almost countless throng passed beside the beloved dead. On Monday, September 26, through beautiful Euclid Avenue, the body was borne six miles to its final resting place. Every house was draped in mourning. Streets were arched with exquisite flowers on a black ground of black. One city alone, Cincinnati, sent two carloads of flowers. Among the many floral designs was a ladder of white immortalities, with eleven rounds bearing the words, Chester, Hiram, Williams, Ohio Senate, Colonel, General, Congress, United States Senate, President, martyr. After appropriate exercises, the sermon being preached by Rev. Isaac Errett, D.D. of Cincinnati, according to a promise made years before, the casket, followed by a procession five miles long, was carried to the cemetery. It was estimated that a quarter of a million people were gathered along the streets, not idle sightseers, but men and women who loved the boy and revered the man who had come to distinguished honor in their midst. Not only in Cleveland were memorial services held. The Archbishop of Canterbury spoke touching words in London. In Liverpool, in Manchester, in Glasgow, and hundreds of other cities, public services were held. Messages of condolence were sent from many of the crowned heads of Europe. Under the White Stone Monument in Lakeview Cemetery, the statesman has been laid to rest. For centuries the tomb will tell to the thousands upon thousands who visit it the story of struggle and success of work, of hope, of courage, of devotion to duty. Like Abraham Lincoln, Garfield was born in a log cabin, battled with poverty, was honest, great-hearted, a lover of America, and like him, a martyr to the Republic. To the world, both deaths seemed unbearable calamities, but nations, like individuals, are chastened by sorrow and learn great lessons through great trials. Now we know in part, but then shall we know, even as also we are known. End of chapter 10 End of Famous American Statesman by Sarah Knowles Bolton Recording by Barry Eads